Another classic. I love that pick. No, uh, oh, God. Hello, everyone. We're here in another edition with the Ring of Honor Shoot Interview Series. We're joined by CM Punk and Classic Cole Cabana. And now, uh, these guys can just start off from where, I guess, where you've met. Where did we meet? Glorious day. <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Okay, well, I, I, I assume that I saw Punk before, and this is, um, I, I had been training at the Domain. He had been, well, you had been training. I started in, like, October of, mm, that would have been 90, 98. 98, yeah. October 98. Um, I got hurt. I started working shows, like, right away with the Domain because I... Was, I was doing shows before I went to the Domain. It was like fucking backyard crap. And uh, I went to the Domain to get trained. I started in October. I somehow hurt my back really bad. I chalk it up to not being an athlete at all. And I hurt myself and I couldn't train for like a couple months. So I, I didn't even bother coming in. And the next time I did come in, I met... But I had seen you before. I met Doug Collins. <laughs> at this point... I was in college in 98, and then, yeah, then 98 to 99, and that summer I was planning to join, I think through uh, Adrian Lynch was my, f my first contact to the domain, and I had contacted him, and then that summer I was going to start training, and I would showed up like three hours before practice just because I wanted to be there so bad, and if I went too late, like I'd miss, I'd hit traffic, so instead of going after traffic and being 10 minutes late, I would go before traffic and be like two hours early, and I'd just sit outside, and I once saw a Punk there, and I saw this guy outside uh, the training center, and like really scraggly tattoos, like really dirty looking, and I was like, oh, gotta be a wrestler, but he was like with this really hot girl, and she was, and I didn't understand it, like, because she looked like a college chick, you know, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that should, like, could be mine, but I guess this is how you gotta look to get these kind of girls, and, and so, and then that was my first impression of punk, and then, so then, Wait, and, so what's your, your first impression of me is I'm dirty, but I get hot girls? They, they, that's the way it's gotta be. It's that's, pretty accurate. I, <laughs> not like dirty, like like uh, like bath sense, but just like. But let's be honest. Punk, well, that's I, later I learned that it would be in bath sense, but mm. at, at, the, at that point it was just uh, you know, like punk rock tattoos. I you know my vision. He didn't give a shit about life. He was <laughs> he was from an alley in the uh, other in the south side of Chicago, <laughs> right? And so, I, gu I guess. And so then I started training, and then punk had got injured. I got injured, yeah, but I mean, I, the first time I really remember meeting you was, uh, I, I was walking in and I remember a ridiculous conversation ensuing, who are you? I'm um, Punk, who are you? Oh, I'm um, Scott, oh, and he always wore the same, it wasn't the same shirt, but it was what I thought was the same shirt to practice every day. It was a Doug Collins basketball camp <laughs> t-shirt, and I... Every single day, but he probably had like 18 of the t-shirts because he went to, <laughs> he financed Doug Collins' <laughs> Porsche going to his basketball camps, apparently. It did nothing for me, too. Clearly, because you're a wrestler now, not yes. a basketball player. But yeah, so we met sometime, like what, I don't know, April-ish? Yes, sir, beginning April of 99, May. beginning of 99, right. so the Colt Command of CM Punk Express has been going strong for over six years. And But at that point, it seemed like that... Uh, that we were the only, and why we clicked so well to came together is that there was just, you know, in these wrestling camps, you know, I, I was going to wrestle here, everyone, you know, I was coming straight out of college football, I figure everyone was a uh, model athlete, 6'3", chiseled, like, you know, this is going to be the roughest, you know, part of my life, and it was hard, but um, that, you know, everyone's going to be, I mean, it was just, you know, a bunch of fat guys, a bunch of old people, and like, me and Punk were like the only two young kids that obviously had grown up loving wrestling, and like, really, really, like, loved being there and were coordinated and, and, you know, if we weren't taught 
you know, we knew what a, what a clothesline was before, you know, Danny or Ace going, put your hand out, the guy will go down, you know, because we knew what a clothesline was or a headlock takeover. So I think that's how, like, the match really started is we both were two young kids loving wrestling. We were, like, the only ones. So that were, like, normal. There's a lot of young kids, but they were all, like, four, like 17, and, you know. But that, I, around that time, I'm thinking about the time frame. It was 98, 99. Everybody was into wrestling because of the NWO or Steve Austin. Right. So it was, a, like, everybody who came into the domain, who's your favorite wrestler? Why do you want to be a wrestler? Fuck Steve Austin, you know. What I was saying, Roddy Piper. And, you know, he's saying Don Morocco. So, yeah, I mean, we, I guess in a sense, um, at that time about as old school as you can get because we'd just been fans all our lives and everybody else was just in it because wrestling was having this huge boom so and you know like we were working places because of people who were training at the domain that also ran shows in like Wisconsin like the first guy I worked for was like Rock and Randy um, we were both goons <laughs> <laughs> uh, pantyhose on our head and uh, like just a ripped denim, like sleeveless vest that was interchangeable. Like everybody who came through the domain was a goon. There was, <laughs> and there was a cast of characters that came to the domain. Like he says, we were the youngest guys. There was uh, Ricky Noga, who was an older dude. He was already like 30. 30. Yeah, he's like 30 years old, working like a construction job or something like he looked that. Looked like he was 16. Though. Yeah, because <laughs> he's you know Polynesian or something. He was very steamboat esque. So. Uh, was Ricky Noga, and he was older. Um, there was Black Dagger was older at the time. The, the Black Dagger, who was the whitest man I've ever met in my entire yes. life. Wow, he's white, but he was black. Of course, uh, <laughs> Brutal Brad, as he's known as Brad Bradley now. Brad Bacon, he was known as. He actually started a <laughs> week before me, <laughs> which, <laughs> if you know anything, that's kind of sad, Brad. <laughs> But he's, he's doing a lot better now. Yes. He, he got sick for a long time. He had like a really bad thyroid problem, which leads to some hilarious stories, which we will, I'm, I'm sure, tell. I remember one time tagging with Brad. I think it might have been before I met you. Okay. It was me and Brad as goons right. against Rock and Randy and Eric Freedom of Midwest Wrestling fame. And Eric Freedom did this hippie gimmick. I mean, he thought I was dirty, dude. Yeah, oh. Eric Freedom, dirt, I mean, dirty beard, long. <laughs> Picture like Jimmy Garvin after like an all night bender and not a, he didn't shower for like two weeks. Like just looks like he's got gre like a thick layer of just cook grease all over him. He would throw Fruit Loops at the fans and like he was he was like this happy hippie guy, um, and he smelled like hot garbage. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're working this tag, and I literally start putting some heat on uh, one of them, and I reached over to tag Brad, and Brad is honest to God on the eight on the the turnbuckle, <laughs> snoring, honest to God, because his thyroid was so like out of control, like he would just crash, and like he, you know, I don't know if it was. Just Whatever, but Brad's retarded. And, okay, so, so my, to my, and I was telling, and I didn't know this was thyroid, but I think Punk chucked it up, and we were talking about it the other day. Is uh, my, my second match ever was for Rock and Randy, and it was against Tough Tom. And Tough Tom was uh, the disorderly conduct who were on Saturday night then. Texas Hangman? Texas Hang. Well, there, yeah. But they, yeah. Were just the, they had the, the long purple, one, right? Long one, the onesie, but like didn't have like the trunks. It was just like one long thing, and I uh, exposed a lot. Like, <laughs> I can see a lot of angles there. And uh, and so, Tough Tom, you know, to me, I was like, I'm fighting Tough Tom. Like, my second match is awesome. You know, and I'm, big, I'm really marking out and, like, you know, hoping to actually learn something. You know, everyone said at that time, you know, when you wrestle these guys, you'll learn something. I really didn't know what that meant, but I just knew I'd learn something. Um, you know, later you find out, well, you know, how you learn stuff and when you wrestle these guys. But I was so happy. I was doing the goon gimmick. It was my second match for Randy in Whitewater, Wisconsin. We, we, I think we drew, like, ten people. And, uh... And so we did the goon, and Brad was goon. So he's like, E, you know, hey, Brad, go out and be, you know, you be a second. You guys can do it like a, a killer B spot. So I'm in there the first match. Tom's getting the best of me. Tom's getting the best of me. Wait, who did you tag with? Oh, it was a singles? I was tagging with Brad. It was yeah. singles match. Yeah, okay. It was a singles match. But Brad was ringside with ringside, you. Ringside. Establishing the goons. Us goons are so interchangeable. <laughs> exactly. So I, so Tom's getting the best of me. You know, we were, we were going to wrestle, you know, 10 minutes or so. Tom's getting the best of me. Um, hits me with something. He goes to jazz to the crowd. I roll out. Brad rolls in. And, you know, as we got about eight minutes left, in the first one minute, 
Tom picks him up, body slams him. One, two, three. <laughs> he doesn't kick out, and it just ruins my match. Like, I had one minute, and, <laughs> and I was so excited to wrestle. I, I was remembering all my stuff, and he, I guess he fell asleep in the count. Or he this, didn't <laughs> To me, this is going to be one of the stories that maybe somebody at home doesn't really think is all that hilarious, but I really think you got to think about it. Second match. His second match ever at this point, right? He gets to work a guy who's fairly, uh, he's a name. He, he's working for WCW. He's doing two gimmicks in WCW. So he's and he's worked all over the world, Puerto Rico, this, right. this, that. Uh, you know, like Tough Tom and, was and a Midwest, and like he was like undercover. He's undercover legend, like yeah, you know. In the Midwest, Tough especially. Tom was like a hell of a worker, and everybody knew it. And he was kind of like the underrated guy. That, oh, Tough Tom, oh, you're gonna have a great match, yeah. you know, blah blah blah. So he's in there. He's all excited. He wrestles him for a minute. Not even rolls out. Tough Tom body slams Brad, does the obligatory, he probably didn't even hook his leg. No, I don't think so. So what does Brad do? Brad rolls in, gets body slammed, and pinned. <laughs> Ruins Holy it. shit. It ruins it. <laughs> and like, and he, I don't think, I don't know how he blamed it on somebody. It's like, you know what? It is for, of course, right? How do you blame it? <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh. It, was, it was an eclipse of the sun, you know? <laughs> no, he, Brad would, like, seriously, he's like narcoleptic. He would just fall asleep. <laughs> Because his body would just crash, you know? Like, I don't know, look up thyroid, Google it, and find out, you know? But I, I, I don't know the medical specifics, but it messed up Brad. He got, like, rail thin and just, I mean, it was. I think it was because his metabolism was so accelerated, you know? And if he didn't, like, I don't know, constantly eat, he's like the Flash, if any comic book nerds out there, you know? Flash's got to eat some candy bars, like, every five minutes, you know? I don't know anything about that. I'm a nerd. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's okay. But that can segue. Into our, into our Rock and Randy Ace story. Was Whitewater. it the same show? No, but it was Whitewater, the next month at Whitewater. Okay, and the next month at Whitewater, our monthly Whitewater shows. And this is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you think uh, Cole Caban and I haven't paid our dues, I really wish we would have videotaped a lot of the stuff that we went through, because we used to... Uh, get to the domain which was on Irving Park and I keep doing that in Chicago, in Chicago so, yeah. Irving Park it's a two lane street park a truck blocking traffic pretty much for like a good hour and a half take the ring down load the truck drive it to Whitewater Wisconsin unload it set it up wrestle take it down put it back in the truck drive it back to the domain and then have to unload it and then put it back up for training the next day you know and I would drive my car to Randy's which is like drive my car 40 minutes to Randy's only to come back past my house to go to the domain with Randy just absolutely yeah. ridiculous <laughs> I mean they were like they were literally like there were some 28 hour days right. you know and obviously it made us appreciate what we have now but you know I mean that's what you got to do when you start so we were all excited just to have the opportunity to wrestle. I think I wrestled Pierce on this show. I don't remember. Yeah. It was my big break. Randy was going to, uh, I, I was, yeah, I wasn't going to be a goon that day. Unless I wrestled as a goon already. And he was like, eee, just go out there and be <laughs> punk. No one will know. Except I got obvious tattoos and that, whatever. Um, I wrestled Pierce maybe. I don't know. I mean, Pierce was uh, instructing me in the back and giving me some pointers. And I don't even remember what the match was. But Randy and Ace were on opposite sides. The big match was, was four-way. Four-on-four because I was in it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then my, my parents had, had driven like two hours, driven two hours, were videotaping it. And I'll tell that story. And I was in there with Eight Ball of DOA. I was pretty excited. And again, Once again, this guy working I'm names left names, and right. And not to mention, I mentioned I wrestled King Kong Bundy through Randy. Like, that oh, was my third You dropped that name here hang on home. Oh, <laughs> that back there um, he was I managed by, by Bobby Heenan and tagged with, with Big John Studd who I never met um, so anyways I was thanks more names I, thanks. Thanks. so I was dressed in eight ball and I was in the first four on four I was in the first spot and within literally 13 seconds of the match I got jobbed out and you hear my mom going <laughs> Like, why? Why is he? Why is he leaving? What's going on? Why did he lose? And my dad's going. He's, he's filming me. Over the leave. the, the yeah. ruckus crowd of six people. Yeah. He's filming me leave into the. And he's like, I guess. Oh, he's gonna pay his dues. I don't know. And my mom's like, what? What's going on? Why? Everyone's wrestling. He's not wrestling. And so that was. And then, and then in that match was uh, was Ace on one side and Randy on the other. 
I don't know. Ace and Randy, I guess, um, had this simmering heat. They would bicker back and forth, and then blah, blah, blah. Ace would talk shit about Randy. Randy would talk shit about Ace. Well, it exploded in Whitewater, Woo! ladies and gentlemen. And I saw, I saw it all go down. They were brawling on the floor, and <laughs> Ace, and like, they're going back and forth, and then Rand, Randy thinks Ace is no-selling them, and Ace is trying to look strong, blah, blah, blah. And then Randy grabs Ace and shoots DDTs him on the floor, to which Ace no-sells. And just start, they start rolling around, and it's like a high school fight, you know. And I looked at Pierce, and I was like, "Should we go break it up?" And Pierce, "Fuck no, dude! This is awesome!" So like, Pierce just runs out there and just stands there, like, like he's trying to get people to like back away. So he's trying to get people to not break it up. He just wants to see the fight. And Pierce just basically rolls them into the the locker room and like closes the door, and then they proceed to like fight. And yeah, it didn't turn into so much of a fist fight as it turned into like this hilarious <laughs> war of words where Randy would go, E, Ace, nobody likes, likes you. And, and and Ace would be like, ah, you're old and stupid. You know, like... And, Purple leg would Yeah, and you know, you know, I was just sitting there watching going, well, I guess I'm not going to work for Randy right. anymore. You yeah, know, like we're too young... Thinking. We're two young guys who... Work. <laughs> we appreciated the work and stuff like that. And, you know, and, but Randy was really cool and like, uh, I'm pretty sure Ace split right away after that. And then Randy was like, "Ee, don't worry about it. You know, you you're good guys. Uh, you just got to get away from Danny and Ace because they're bad and trying to tell us to get away from Danny and Ace. And we are just kind of like stuck in the middle. But still they, looking break. back on it, like Randy really could have flexed and you know been like, I'm not going to use you guys anymore. Sure. Um, but on the other hand, his entire card was made up of domain guys. <laughs> it's like, you know, so I don't know what was he going to do. You know." And that, and the same match I talked about earlier, where I was working, tagging with Brad, where he decided to fall asleep on the turnbuckle. Randy, this is the Wisconsin territory. Yeah, Randy uh, is the first time I met Boogie Woogie. Ooh. I was all stoked. Boogie was awesome. Um, Randy blew out his knee doing a Vader bomb to me, like the Vader splash, like off the second. And Randy's like the smoothest, like Midwestern, like Wisconsin, you know, guy ever. He does the Vader bomb, and I heard his knee like he went, he bounced to go do it, and his knee like. Slipped down the rope, like his foot stayed on the rope, and it, and it went down. And I heard his knee pop, and he, you know I just saw him, like I'm laying underneath him, and I just saw him go. And then he does the Vader bomb, <laughs> and he, as he's covering me, it wasn't the finish. He goes all calmly, "Yee, I blew out my knee." <laughs> <laughs> this is the finish. Right. Like, just all calm and, like, you know, collective. And he, I, he pinned me, and I, like, rolled out. And he just fucking laid there. And I felt, like, so awful for him because he just, like, blew his knee out doing a Vader bomb. But, like, I remember him cursing that he couldn't complain about it because it was his ring. Whereas if it was somebody else's ring, yeah, you could obviously right. yell at the guy, like, right. hey, jerk, <laughs> your ring's the shits. But it was his ring, so. I mean, Randy's ring was pretty, pretty good, actually. Any the Randy stories? What a I don't know, but um, as far as me and Cabana like becoming friends and stuff like that, I think it was like it was it was pretty bitching for me to see. I truly believe that if me and you went to high school together, we we probably would have hated each other, or at least I would have hated you. I've been it for seven years now. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no way I would I. I don't talk to anybody from my high school. I barely talk to people like while I was in high school. Um, I wasn't so much, you know, I'm not, I wasn't like a big loner or whatever. I had my friends and all that, but it was just, I don't know. High school was just like a, a means to an end, I suppose. But like, I'm great friends with this guy and I love all his buddies from high school and they're all tight and stuff like that. And I just think if I ever met him back in the day, we never would have been friends, but we met. We were, I was the jack. I yeah, I, I guess. We were all football players. And I met, we met because of wrestling and it was just like, I didn't see him as like the jock kid where I probably would have in high school. I just saw him as somebody who loved wrestling like as much as I do. Yeah. You know, and it, it pretty much blossomed from there. And like I remember me being like super nervous kid, like in the business, not knowing like what to do or how to go about work. And it's like it's pretty nerve wracking when you first start off and you know anybody can tell you, well this is how you get work. You know, you just gotta call a promoter and you say, I'm this you know, I can come in, I I, I need experience, I want work, blah blah blah. And you know, you just I think that early in the game, you know, you're like, oh, who's going to use me? Why would somebody use me? And, and I was always nervous to... And at the same time, no one... There was a big, you know, Danny and Ace, even though we loved them and they trained us and we thought the world of them, and still do. Well, well yeah. There was a 
big harp on your Danny and Aces guys, we're not going to use you. Yeah. That was at that time, so. Yeah. And that's the thing about, you know, the, the wrestling business is like whoever you roll with, you're pretty much guilty by association, yeah. you know, and, you know, whatever. I stand by Ace Steel. He is my boy. <laughs> but uh, so, I, I credit you to... Because I'm pretty sure I piggybacked my way onto that Mid America Wrestling show, you know. Like, I was just kind of, I never actively sought work because I was like almost too nervous to do it, like too afraid. You know, Randy would just say, "E, you're booked," or you know, Danny Nace would go, "Come with us, you're, you know, you're booked." Um, I remember one time going up and working. Uh, it was a tag, you know. Like they would, they would bring their students up and they would say, "Hey, let's work our students." You know, we'll put on a good match for you. I work, It was me and Ricky Noga against Danny and Ace uh, in Racine, Wisconsin. Maybe somewhere in Racine. I don't know. Um, and it was one of my first matches, and I got jean shorts and a wife beater on, and I came out wearing the the skull cap, and I was all, you know, whatever. And Ricky Noga's got gear, and he's got the Ricky Steamboat headband, and he's tan, and he looks good, and I look like shit. Um, I just remember I'm supposed to be a baby face, but everyone's not buying it. You know, I'm slapping hands, and everyone's just like, oh, look at this fucking shit. Straight out of wrestling school? Yeah. I wasn't there. I can only assume. Come on. Yeah, you can only assume how many times I said, come on, baby. You know? And, you know, just like his first uh, impression of me was probably these people's first impression of me, and the people were just booing me and blah, blah, blah. And I remember this one guy, he had Oshkosh gosh overalls on, nothing underneath, started yelling at me. And he's, you know, and I was babyface, so I couldn't say anything back. I was just kind of like, yeah, come on, baby. And as he was yelling at me, his glass eye fell out of his head. <laughs> And like we're making, you know, we're we're making the way around the ring. We're like, come on, baby, slapping hands, and Ricky Nilga trails off, and I, <laughs> I just stopped, and I was like, and the guy, uh, calm as hell, nonchalantly, picked it up, blew on it, and put it back in his head. You suck, I bought. And I was, <laughs> I was weirded out for the rest of the match. Yep. Cre creeped me out. Before me, man. Right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit before you. I mean, because then I, because I remember I got hurt, and then uh, the first time I ever went up and met Randy, I, I was in no condition to work because my back was hurt. But it was like a, a come on up, um, meet him, and you know, blah blah blah. And I, I met Randy, and I was like, I, I'm hurt, you know, but I, I want to work, and this and this and that. Oh, E, can you can you work? Can the kid work? Well, he's new. He, he can you know do this and this and that. Blah blah. blah. E, I put you with Bambino, little Dino Bambino. And uh, so Randy was like, E, well, can you help me out today? You know. And so I, I helped try to put up the ring, even though my back was a shambles. And then I remember doing security for him, where I absolutely beat the living crap out of this one guy. And I think that's why Randy always liked me, is because there's this little stage, and it's a VFW hall where everybody's just getting tanked. You know, it was like the thing to do. I think all the kids in see wrestling get yeah, drunk. I mean everybody in the town would just go because there were such small towns in Wisconsin would just go get plastered at the wrestling shows and uh, I don't know how it started six years ago six seven years ago but the one guy um, tried to start something and I was on like this little riser like a like for like a drum set you know like just standing there like doing security and he tried to go after Lynch or something I don't know what happened and he like um, he like swung at me and I like I socked him in the face and like he went down and his hand was on the the riser and I remember just like you know the scene in Bloodsport where uh, like, get the leg where he does the kick and you get like the view of like the, the like he gets, does the he's evil like split nah, he does like the <laughs> evil stomp onto his leg and he's like oh ah <laughs> well I totally did that to this guy's hand you know and he he comes up like tote at the end of Indiana Jones when he just burns the the, the medallion into his hand and he comes up going ah like looking at his hand and it I mean it was crooked and I broke his fingers and he just ah and then he fell over and then I gave him like the same stop like right to the balls because it's crowd control people if there's one thing I know from 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 getting into fights and stuff like that you know if there's a whole bunch of angry drunks you got to dispatch the first one in the most brutal way you possibly can to discourage anybody else from trying to fight you and it worked and I just remember the guy like you know, like limping out and me feeling real bad because I stomped him with the same vigor that I, I, you know, I stomped his nuts with the same force and vigor that I stomped his hand with. And I saw what his hand looked like. Can't imagine what his <laughs> testicles, like, you know, like, I could have seriously hurt the guy, but Randy loved it. Eee, 
you're a shit kicker. Who the hell would call you? I, you you're, you're a scrapper. Scra yeah. it, was, it, was, it was some ridiculous, <laughs> you know, thing. So that's why Randy always loved me. I, I can only assume, you know. And those were our first work days. I went from there to uh, Carmine Despirito and Mid-America Wrestling. And... I remember feeling bad because you pretty, I mean, you hooked the whole thing up, yeah. and I, I think I just piggybacked with you. Well, I had seen Carmine as, as, a, as a mark. Uh, I went to his show, and uh, I loved it. Like, I thought he ran a great show, you know. Uh, I think I was 17 in high school, and so, you know, I knew that. And, then, and like, uh, was Pierce there? No, he hadn't been there at the time. But uh, some good, some, you knew, like, you saw it was a good wrestling show as opposed to, I, you know, I went to some indie shows, and I saw some bad wrestling, and I, oh, this is some good stuff. Yeah, Pierce was there because he wrestled. He had to have been there. Billy Joe. St. Holmes. Yeah, he wrestled yeah. Derek St. Holmes on the one show I saw. And uh, so I wanted to go work for him. And uh, and so I was at, in Michigan at the time, but Rob, uh, uh, Van, Van, what's, what's Van Pell? What was his name? Like? Movie Marty. <laughs> I was making a movie. <laughs> Hence Movie Marty. Yeah. And, <laughs> what, was our, what was our tag name? The Hot Stuff? The, the hot Lover boys? boys? The Hot People? The no. Lover Boys, wasn't it? It was something. It was something real awful. The fuck we're going to take. And so it, he was making this movie, which he spent like all this money on the PWG belts, which then he sold on eBay. After he, yeah, by the way, we're going to jump around a lot. Yeah. If that hasn't been discussed yet. So, and, uh, and so he was going to make a movie. So I was like, sweet, I'm going to be a movie. And so then I was like, well, I, while we're going to go to Wisconsin, like, Carmen had a show and it was a perfect opportunity because Danny Dominion always said he was looking for people. And I thought it was going to be a really hard show. You know, now looking back on it, probably anybody could be on his show. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, I was always meek and like oh why would I you know blah, blah, blah. And looking back at it now like geez like you know give him to give him buy him a beer give him 20 bucks and yeah and you're on you're on the show like but back then it seemed like it seemed like trying to get into Oxford or Yale or yeah, something like yeah. it just seemed impossible so we hooked it up and I was like hey you want and at that point I think I might have said a statement where like I saw Pierce and I was a big kind of mark for I hadn't seen a lot of it in the wrestling but I was a big mark how like Reckless Youth and Quack and these guys in the Super 8 was just start you know just started or whatever and I was a big mark for seeing them in the magazines. You know, obviously you'd see Hogan and, you know, LT was wrestling Bam Bam. But then you'd see these guys who, that was, who, who like, weren't in the big show, but were in these magazines. And obviously, you know, it, it, it always mesmerized me how um, awesome it was that these, not like lower, but, you know, lower leg, lower fed guys or indie guys were trying to make a name for themselves. And they weren't in the big show, but they were getting press. And, you know, and that, that always mesmerized me. Yeah, and being in a magazine was, like, tough back yeah, then. It was yeah. unbelievable, and, and like that was, you know, and I couldn't believe it. I saw, you know, I see their pictures. Wow, you know, look, you know, that's something I know, I know I can do. I'd like to start there before I go to WWF or whatever. And and they were wrestling all over the place, and you see, and then Pierce was a Midwest guy who wrestled all over the place. So it was kind of like, well, Pierce wrestled in, in Milwaukee, and later, you know, we knew Pierce wrestled down south for Ian, and later we would go there. And so it was like, you know, I was like, punk. Let's work every weekend anywhere we can. Who cares where it is? Right. Let's jewel we'll drive. We'll, we'll we'll find somebody to drive us. But we'll get to later. And uh, and so that was where. And this was kind of the first that we've done. Randy's. Okay. Now we're gonna put Carmine on our uh, on our on our once a month place and later go other places. So now we're at Carmine's. Right. And we've done the show. And I you know I guess I'd hooked up. I was hey I'm you know I'm gonna wrestle with Punk. Um, we'll be the opener or whatever. He was like cool you know blah blah blah. And then. Well, from working at the domain with each other, I think it was like <laughs> Ace. Ace would roll in like a half hour, forty-five minutes late, and like just so we we weren't just sitting around not doing anything. Like everybody else would get to the domain, like um, say practice was supposed to start at seven. Everybody would show up at seven. Me and Cabana would have been there for a half hour already. So we had boots laced, ready to roll at seven. After a while, like Ace got sick of it, like everybody pretty much showing up late. So he would. Show up later and later and later. So me and him. I think I got a key in there. Yeah, like yeah, you got a key, and then we just started going in there like whenever we could and doing stuff. So Ace would show up and he would sit there and we watch the stuff we were doing in the ring. And it's like almost like you don't want to try stuff in front of your trainers at first because it might be kind of embarrassing. But when it was me and him alone, we'd go buck wild like, oh let's try this. And <laughs> you know, I remember trying moon salts for the first time and like all this stuff. And it was just you know we're the only ones who actively would do 
do spots in the ring, and I remember Ace would tell us to do a spot just to see if we could do it, and we would do it. So he would try to make it more difficult, and this and this and that. So I think you got it hooked up with Carmine, and Carmine was like, "Well, who can you work?" And then you were like, "Well, you," you know, and you know, obviously. And then it pretty much just like went from there, except the fact that uh, I guess Carmine liked Punk. liked me, and I was I looked I wrestled too much like Danny Dominguez. And is that what he said? That's, he goes, I don't want another Dominion. That's the, he so, meant, so I was so <laughs> random. I think it's once again like, and and you know, like I mean, I look like crap. If Cabana actually brought pictures, yeah. If there was a, if there was ever a, an embarrassing picture of me. I'm sure it's in here. Which one is it? I don't know. I just want people to see like how awful my body was. <laughs> and like it's amazing to me now. Like you want to show them Stinky for you? Oh yeah, yeah. Here, you know what? Stinky you grab that one. Yeah, so it wasn't here. Yeah. We'll try to uh, show you some pictures right now detailing the past. There's you and Bundy. Yeah, that was my third match. What, should I just hold it up here? Yeah, just hold it up for a little bit. Okay. Tell me when it's good. Me and Bundy. Good? Yeah. Can you see me? Here's Goon Squad. <laughs> and then there's Big Brad right there. Alright? We got that. Boom. We're trying to find. Here's my first match against Doink. Here's you, my first match ever for Atkinson. Wisconsin. Excellent. Alright. <laughs> I'm just dropping. We'll pick them up. Yeah. Okay. You got one of you? I don't know. This was one of our first ones. That, I mean, it's a good sunny day. We don't want that. It's a good what? All right, here's me in college. Got that? Who is that? Me in college, right? And my college buddy is Matt Capitelli, tough enough three wheeler. <laughs> so there's that. The aforementioned there's stinky Fre Eric Freedom. But I guess he shaved that day. He's been known to have a dirty. D a pick, pick, imagine like a dirty ass beard with like mealworms Gar in it. Gar Jimmy Garvin is. Uh, I mean, come on. That's set. Jimmy yeah. Garvin. Like, yeah. yeah that's... Well, when he had that beard. So I can't find pictures of your, your awesome body. Yeah. My tremendous body. So. Here's more Goon Squad. Is this you? It's got to be you. Yeah, that was me running around. If I recognize anybody in the crowd, I'll shit myself. More Goon Squad, Cole Cabana. You get the gist of the outfit, <laughs> which was just absolutely ridiculous. The panty on the head, to me, was simply amazing. And it doesn't get any better than that. that that's, a, um, that's kind of... You started working out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is... West Dallas, Wisconsin, uh, the famous Mid-America wrestling shows would take place here every month. Um, this was one of our, uh, this is when Cabana started working for him regularly. That's when I got the call back. It was about a year after our <laughs> first match there. Like, I really wish we had, like, uh, is that, because that, that's even later, yeah, but that's, no, like, that's how awful. Bad. But that's, should I show how is awful? That that's, uh... I well, I think I look terrible in this picture, but this is once again years later. So imagine how bad I looked when I first started. And then Harley Race, the legend. It was Harley Race, our referee. Yeah. And the story about Harley Race is when uh, when we're in the back and he, we're going over what's going on, and he was telling me, uh, he's like, all right, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna hook you, then I'm gonna punch you. And then Punk's gonna, you know, that Punk was gonna come and, and get me behind. I was gonna give you a German. A German suplex. He punched me with the German. So in the back, he goes, bam! And it was the hardest fucking punch ever. And I was like, and I, you know, I knew what, you know, smartly not, not going, Harley, you hit me. What, you know, ow. You know, I was like, yes, sir, that sounds great. Thank you. And, uh, it, was, it fucking killed. It fucking killed. And then out there, you know, I think because I didn't say that, it was the lightest thing I ever felt in the ring when he did it. So. Now, that was the night um, I had just bought my brand new 2001 Monte Carlo. I think I bought it like August 10th. I remember, I think we, I might have drove it down to Ian's when we did that big eight man with Scorpio. And then like a couple weekends later, it was the, me and him for the Mid America heavyweight title. Um, with Harley as the ref. Harley gets so blitzed at the uh, at the after party. Um, Mind you, Ace is feeding him shots left and right. Oh, fans were yeah, buying. Fans. I mean, you're Harley Race and buy you shots, buy you shots, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Ace is like, hey, can you give Harley a ride back to the hotel? I was like, yeah, no problem, dude. It's Harley Race. Like, I just was marking out. Awesome, right? So Ace jumps in the back seat. Harley's riding shotgun. Right before we get in the car, Harley does one of these 
drunken warbles and then stops himself on my car and then let's go this great burp that I knew there had to be some vomit up there, you know? And I looked at him, but then I never fear. That's Harley Race, man. He can hold his alcohol. No sure, score. right? No score. We get in the car, he starts burping again. And I'm nervously looking, like, oh my God, what is going on? And then Harley proceeds to start vomiting. But he's Harley Race. He's probably had a bender or two in his life. He's probably thrown up in many a car. He's not spraying it like all over my car. No, no, because that would not be old school enough. <laughs> he's throwing up in his mouth and then spitting it out the window, <laughs> which is making this this noise haunts me to this day. He would throw up, and he had the window all the way down, and he would. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, oh my God, are you okay? And he's just going. <laughs> and I just see Ace in the rearview mirror. Ace is freaking out. He's beat red. His eyes are all bugging out of his head. He's got to cover up his mouth so he doesn't laugh. So I start to pull over. And Harley chokes down puke. Think about that. He swallowed it and goes, keep driving. We don't want to alert the authorities. <laughs> oh, shit. So I just keep driving. And he's. Earl. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, and it, <laughs> about 90% of the vomit went out of the car. About a good 10% went in. And, you know, it was, like, all sprayed, like, all over. It looked, yeah. We, we just worked, right, the month before we did 60-minute match. Then we did this one. And I was so pissed at you that I, I wasn't pissed at you because he took home Harley or whatever. And I wanted to be in that car so bad, like, after he told me the story. I was so upset that I didn't go. And then after this awesome story. You would have gotten vomited out of <laughs> Yeah, it's fine with me, Harley Race. Because, <laughs> yeah, we got Harley to the, the hotel, and I'll never forget, like, Harley, can you ever forgive me, my friend, for throwing up in your new car? And I was just like, sure, Harley. <laughs> I, yeah. And he gave me, like, a little, you know, like, respect knuckles, like, all right, kid, <laughs> I'll see you later. And, like, he'd start walking away, and we were like, Harley, the elevator's over here. And he'd turn around and walk in. And me and Ace just got in the car and just bust out laughing, you know. Next day, I took my car to the car wash and uh, ran it through the car wash. And I, uh, some kid came up to me and he was like, "Man, I was scrubbing the side of your door for 15 minutes. This shit wouldn't come off. What was that?" So like, you a wrestling fan, kid? Yeah. You know who Harley Race is? Yeah. Well, that was his puke. Handed the kid like five bucks and the kid just stood there like, "What?" And I jumped in the car and drove away. So my car got christened by. Uh, yeah, it was seven. An eight-time champion, world champion Harley Race. Awesome stuff. Okay. And so from Milwaukee, we'd started our St. Paul trips. We start going to St. Paul or Ian's more regularly. St. Paul, because when Ian wanted us to date, we'd have to take St. Paul first. Mm. I always hear about uh, St. Paul from Danny and Ace, obviously, about how you got to be a worker to go up there, and everybody's got a body, and you're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. So that was always my big goal. I was told I wasn't ready, so I was like, oh, I got to get ready for St. Paul. I got to get ready for St. Paul, you know. And uh, we were both kind of just like thrown into the fire. Like we got taken up there one time, and uh, Ace couldn't. It was, it was St. Paul Championship Wrestling, right? And it was, I think, the biggest indie in. In the Midwest because of Ace, Danny, and Pierce, and, and Quinn. Quinn, and yeah, yeah, so it was it was like I listened on the net. I remember it was a big deal like that, like Midwest Renegade Wrestling or something. It was like yeah, but that Ian's, yeah, or, but you know, but it was a big deal to be. It was a good promotion. You wanted just like Reckless and Quack or whatever had you know made their name in like PCW or ECWA or whatever. Like this was kind of like you know making like, oh, oh well at least that's what was going through my mind. Yeah, no, totally. Wow, I got it got built ourselves. up huge yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah. Like I was like wow, St. Paul. So when we finally went up there, like, the road trips were just hilarious. Like, probably the funniest times I've ever had in my entire life, you know. I mean, a bunch of grown men, you know. I mean, we would get, like, a, one of those big 15-passenger vans, and it would be me, Cabana, Ace, Danny, Ricky Noga, Black Dagger, Derek St. And we'd stop off in uh, Wisconsin to pick up Derek St. Holmes. Yes. Sometimes Brad did the trips. Pierce, that's nine guys and gear, you know. So that's, like, I mean, it was just, and it's ridiculous. Uh, I'll be damned if anybody fell asleep first because they would just be crucified. 
Uh, I got put in like the, I think I worked ace for like the, and it wound up being like a light heavyweight title tournament or something like that. And it turned out like ace couldn't be at the next show because I think wasn't it him and Danny were doing the NWA 51st. Oh, was that what it was? Is that, I think. Okay. Maybe. They were or, doing the, or, or Elliot's brother's wedding. Something. Okay. Ace couldn't be there. So um, they were originally obviously going to put the belt on ace, like the light heavyweight strap. Oh, that was the month before I went. It wound, it wound up being okay. like, yeah, I wound up working ace, and like they're like, we're going to put the belt on you. And I was just like, wow. And to me, it wasn't so much like, cool, I got a belt. It was like, well, I got this belt, so that means I get steady work now. <laughs> that means every month I got to be on the shows, you know? And it just, it almost, it totally like broke me out of my shell where I was all shy and stuff like that before, because now I had this belt, so I was cutting promos. And it was on TV, you know? And if you, if you really, if you ask like a lot of the young guys that started off in Minnesota, like Sean Davari, Austin Aries, a lot of those guys, you know, it sounds weird, but would watch me and Cabana on TV, you know, like... It was proper TV, it was yeah, it WB was, or something. Yeah, it was like straight, it was, it's not like every indie guy says, you know, every indie promoter says, oh, we got TV, blah, blah, blah. This is real TV, yeah. you know, sponsors and the whole deal. So, like, I remember Davari, you know, putting up rings. He wasn't even working on shows yet. He was training for like two weeks, you know. Like um, he was like 14. <laughs> yeah, like 16. 14. He's like 120 pounds, you know. And I think he like sent, he, he mass emailed out his website or something. Sorry to 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 punk you out, Davari. He, he had a devastation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, and then you, you'd go, okay, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at college board in the computer lab, and, you know, I'll look at it, the fuck, this guy, you know, he's, his first match, and he's, like, email, mass emailing everybody, like, look at it, and he's 16, and he's a pube, and he's, like, this is a pube means you're fucking a tiny little kid, and then also next time, we'd, you know, and, and, you know, email punk, I have a laugh at this guy, or whatever, or, or did you see this fucking dude, and, and then all of a sudden, we see him putting up the rings, and we're like... <laughs> and you know, but like, and it turns out he's like an awesome guy, and you know, we're all friends with him. And now he's rich. Yes. <laughs> so who's laughing and now? Now we're scrapping for you to buy this shoot interview so I can eat dinner. Um, so, yeah, so we got TV, and then. Uh, okay, well, then I, I'd like to go into where, uh, where, where Danny and Ace were go to a wedding. And, and Pierce is the babysitter now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Pierce is the babysitter, and our after shows were always at BW threes. And uh, at the time, I, you know, I'm in college, and, I, and it's, it sucked because it's a seven hour drive from Chicago to Minnesota, and I would be coming from Kalamazoo, Michigan, so it ended up being a ten hour drive for me every month. And uh, so I was at college, and a lot of stupid college stuff was going on, and, and I had some tricks that I pulled out that you know I was going to impress everybody, like look at my cool tricks while I get a laugh, because we're looking for laughs on the road. That was the big thing. You know, and this is the first time we're unsupervised. Pierce was no babysitter at all. It was the first time we were without Danny or Ace, you know, to where we were like, we were in a comfortable setting. Like when we did the first Mid America show, Danny and Ace weren't there, but it, we were new. So we weren't, you know, going to go all crazy and stuff yeah. like that. And we didn't know, you know, to rib and all this other stuff. So it's like we were already over in St. Paul. We'd already worked there a bunch of times. And we were already really super comfortable with everything. Right. You know, we were like all stars. <laughs> so without Danny and Ace, we're gonna cause some trouble, so, you know. Uh, and me and Punk aren't drinking. We, you know, uh, I think everyone else was probably hammed up, but we, you know, we weren't drinkers. So we, we you know, diet cokes and styrofoam cups. And, and one of my new tricks was I would poke out the bottom, right, of this styrofoam cup, take it out, and what I do is I I'd unzip my pants and, and uh, I'd get a straw, I'd put that in first, and then I would put my ball sack through the bottom of the cup. And, uh, and what's that called? And it would be called a ball cocktail. Ball cocktail. <laughs> and I and what I did is I'm doing this with this unzipped, and I got the cup here, and I put the straw in. So it looks natural, like yeah. you know, he's just kind of sitting Hanging there, out. especially if you're sitting down, you know, you're just like that. And then I think I, I'm telling you know you guys, and but before that I go you know check this out, check this out, and then you know I show them, they're all laughing, and then I ask the waitress, I go, can I get a refill, please? And she goes, what you got? I go, a ball cocktail. And she's like, what do you mean? I go, just a ball cocktail. And she looks in there. And it's like the, the puzzled look on her face. Uh, and then she realized it's my testicles in a cup. And then all of a sudden we all start doing ball cocktails. Yeah. Pierce was in love with He couldn't wait to put his ball well, in Well, but Pierce, cup. like me and you were like all incognito like ball cocktail. I think Pierce just whipped his nuts out. We're like, dude, look at my nuts. You know, like Pierce is always just trying to one up you, you know. So we're all running around like pretty much half naked. And I start dancing on top of a table. Well, 
the, the, the cops, or is this after? Yeah, this is okay, after, okay, but like, it, I mean, it's it, once it all starts hanging out, like, you okay. know, literally, it's, you know, ball cocktail. I'm on the table. I take the shirt off. I'm doing, like, stripper <laughs> stuff. I'm getting dollars. So I'm like, oh, this is awesome, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. And Buffalo Wild Wings had uh, two entrances that were right across from each other. And I remember seeing, like, the police yeah. start walking in the one entrance and me just grabbing Cabana and going, we're leaving, and, like, walking out, walking out the other entrance and just, like, getting in the car and, like, kind of sitting there until, like, I think Pierce came out or I don't know. But I was spooked. I was like, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Like, we're staying here. Like, I'm not getting arrested. This is crazy. And, uh, not the first time the cops were called on me, but I think the first time cops in, in the wrestling business oh. the cops were called on me, you know. I wasn't familiar with this. Yeah. Except in high school when I got caught for having a hot dog and bologna fight in you know, cars. It's a lot different than actually having yes. your hot dog and bologna <laughs> hanging out. So, you know, we could have gotten arrested for, like, you know, what, public indecency or whatever. That's what they said. So when they, they said, like, later we asked someone else, like, as we, I think we came in, you know, we turned the hat around, maybe put on a different shirt. But I don't know. But they were like, yeah, so, you know, the cops are called for public indecency or something. Like, that was a legit call. So it got back to Danny and Ace. <laughs> I don't think Danny heard about it right away, but I think Ed Hellier, the promoter, like found out about it eventually and like really yelled at Danny. He was real mad because, you know, we could have lost sponsors. Why are these kids walking around this public restaurant with their balls hanging out? You know, like all this ridiculous stuff. And I remember Danny telling me when he found out, like he called up Ace and he's like, I tried to be mad, you know? He's like, but I called up Ace. And I was like, did you hear what these guys did? And I guess Ace knew, but he tried to, he had to play dumb because he didn't, you know, he was supposed to be mad at us. I, I don't know. So, no, what? <laughs> he walked around with their balls in a cup. And they both just started laughing on the phone. Like, how ridiculous is this? You know, like, how can we be mad at these guys? Like, Taught them well. <laughs> ball cocktail. Yeah, they, you know. So they were, like, all impressed. You know? And the other thing was, like, there was there was soup cocktail where you, you get a bowl and you got to them in there. There was, like, a bunch of cocktails. Like, was, There's lots of nut humor. There's the gum. No, ball, I'm sorry, ball soup, ball soup. Gum on the shorts. Gum on the shorts. Gum on the shorts. The tumor. You get, you know, I guess that's, you, you, you put your balls up, you know, above your cock and in your belt and then you lift your shirt. Like, I kind of, you know, I'd go to everyone I'd work or whatever, or, you know, we do all these, go to these guys. Dude, you got me hard in the stomach tonight. You got me hard in the stomach, you know, like, fuck. Fucking right, like really, like I think, like is it, you know, like I think you popped out a tumor, and then you're really scared, and, you, you, and then you lift up your shirt, and there's your balls. Didn't in. somebody poke it once? And then cash flow. Cash flow. Not to me though. Not to me though. Was it hero or? Everybody would be doing it because it was like the smoothest thing ever. Like Cabana, you know, he introduced that and he introduced the Gold Bond, which invented the Gold Bond Mafia. Yes. And it was the smoothest thing ever. So like everybody's trying to do it. And I think Hero does it to Cash Flow. Like, oh, dude, look at this. You know, I think I'm hurt. You think this is serious? What is this? And Cash Flow is all like, yo, man, everybody look at this. What is, what is that? And he started fucking poking it like... That's that's he nice. Balls. Yeah, he touched he touched the hero's balls. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, Working for Ian, we met Chucky Smooth. Yes. I think Dave Prezak was pretty instrumental in getting us both booked for IWA. I remember you got you booked first, of course, and then I rode your coattails to uh, IWA. Right? Yeah, I always remember that. I think, but I always appreciated that. I think he he liked you, and he. Dave was like, we got me, Trailer Park, kid, and maybe you were working at the time, too. Uh, and, like, there was one more room. There was a, another one room, and you were like, you know, like, I'm in Mid-American, you know, like, you know, go take it. I'm yeah. happy to do that, too, and I was always appreciative for that. Right. There was, like, one more spot in the car, and it was, car. like, Prezak, I guess, was trying to get me booked, and I was, like, like once again, felt bad for him doing all the legwork to get us booked for Mid-American, and me pretty much getting the spot, and he <laughs> did not. So I said, go do IWA, blah, blah, blah. But then he would put me over to Ian. Right. Yeah, you know, me and Punk are going to have these great matches, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he got me in, and that's when we pretty much just started feuding all over the country. It was like we did the thing in Mid America. Um, we'd be wrestling here and there on Randy shows, and then we started. We right off the bat, we're like feuding in IWA, kind of um, formed like the Gold Bond Mafia. But like when we would get booked for like Cleveland All Pro or like places in Norm. Detroit, Norm Connors, stuff like that, it was out because we were the only ones who were actively going. We want to work for you. We're gonna email you. We're gonna call you, and we're gonna send you tape. We're and, a good match. Too. Yeah. And it was just like, because since we were the only two doing it, it was, oh, okay, well, uh, can you two work each other? Well, of course. You know, and that's how the uh, the series of matches happened. You know, we've wrestled each other everywhere. I mean, it's how we started in Ring of Honor. You know, how do you bring these guys in? You, we came in working each other, you know. Um, 
What's some good Gold Bond Mafia stories? Well, how the gold, did you tell how the Gold Bond start, Mafia started? No, dude. It was a comic con. Like, you never done it on any... Okay. And, uh... So, at this point, I guess we're, getting, we're all getting maybe a little too cocky for our own good. And, uh, you know, we're... Uh, the Comic Con's in Illinois, and this time we're doing Gold Bond Mafia. And Gold Bond was another college thing where my roommate would put Gold Bond on his nuts and it would make it tingle, and it was the greatest feeling ever. And no one knew it, though. You know, I was like... I was so scared to do it, and he's like... Got to do it, and I did it. And, I was like, and then we go on road trips in Minnesota, and be like, everybody, I, hands out. We hey, do it, and everyone, you know, Pierce thought it was the biggest rip of the world, and then, and then afterwards, it's like the tingling sensation. Oh, it's excellent. And so then finally, um, you know, we we bring in gold bond. Hey, everybody, gold bond. Oh, everybody, bond up. Everybody, bond up. And then we were doing Ian's shows, and then we did like a Friday, Saturday Ian's show, and then we did a Sunday. Uh, we wanted to get up to the Comic Con because we because wa Punk wanted to go to the Comic Convention, I, I mean, and Chucky wanted to go. Well, to it was more of like because uh, didn't we do like we did some insane schedule where it was like we did Friday, Saturday. I know we didn't sleep to get our dates. No, day. not at all. We did yeah. like we did three shows in like three days, and then Maybe Sunday. We did Minnesota Friday. It was it was ridiculous. Yeah, it was, it was cool. like one of the it was like Minnesota, like all the way down to Ian's, and then like all the way back up for the Comic Con. We started and, at two, and, and it was Ian's more, got done at three in the morning. Yeah, and it was more or less for me at least. Like, I just wanted to get into the Comic Con for free. You know, like I'll be damned if I'm going to pay that much money. Right. You know, uh, one of my first jobs was working at a comic shop, and so like I wanted to you know go do the thing there at the comic shop and blah blah blah. So we showed up, and there was a guy named Tim Lyle. Was it? Yeah, but uh, Chucky used to. Here's us in IW. Here's Chucky, and then this was a stripper chick. Uh, <laughs> this yeah. Kind of the Gold Bond Mafia here. And this was us down in IWA. And Chucky we used to work for Tim Lyle. Like, we didn't know Chucky, and we met him. We all, you know, he came from here, we came from here, we met down at IWA. And he used to work for Tim Lyle, so he's like, hey, I can get you guys on the Comic Con, you know, if you want to work it. And it was all just, you know, a bunch of. And probably Jimmy Jacobs was probably on the show. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I remember Quackenbush was there. Yeah. Because he did some movie, like some movie about, like, comic book characters or crime fighters or something like that. It was the first time we'd ever met Quack. Right. And I remember so being, like, excited, and we were supposed to work him. Like, you know, because it was like Comic-Con, it was almost like an attraction. It was like wrestling every 15 minutes. So There's just match after match after match. There's like 87 matches, right? So we got there, and we are talking, like, oh, well, I was going to work this kid, and then Cabana was going to work this guy, and then we were going to do this match, and blah, blah, blah. Um, three days of, like, no sleep and, like, just restlessness, and then finally, like... And again, I think we were, we were a little too khaki for our own bridges. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so we were like, well, we kind of run the show here. And yeah, so... So we were like, well, we want to work. We want to work yeah. that guy, you know. And like, Tim Lyle was probably like, who the fuck do these yeah. guys think they are? You know, blah blah blah. Um, I think what is it? I worked Chucky. You yes, because I worked after you guys, and he was all worried, and I had like a regular match. But he worked Chucky. Me and Chucky didn't have so much of a regular match. No, and it was it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life at that time. And I don't know how you want to like. Prezak was the manager. This is how the Gold Bond Mafia, I guess, formed, you right. know, because Prezak had the Gold Bond powder, and we just specifically were going to work towards a spot where Prezak would literally throw the entire bottle of powder and like just... With the spots in that match. Oh, the spots were brilliant. Duck and elbow, duck and close and duck and elbow, duck and close and duck and elbow, duck and close and duck and they went and then it started, there was no serious spots in that match. No, not at all. What, do you remember any of the silly, like... We did midget spots where Chucky would like bite my ass and I would tell the ref and then, you know, eventually he bit the ref's ass and we did like, you know, Chucky would cover me and I would kick him out and the ref would grab him and throw him back on me. We did like midget spots and like, you know, we did that spot where I, like, duck my elbow, duck my clothes on, and, like, we just kept going and right. kept going. And finally, we both got our hands on our knees and we're tired, and we look up at each other and we, like, do the double eye <laughs> poke, you know, and then the double clothesline, and, like, yeah, and, and it was like, then he would hit a stunner, and, like, I mean, it was, it was just. So Lyle was hot at this point. Yeah, it's, we just made a, we made a mockery. I think that was Lyle's quote, we was, made you made a mockery of the business. And my attitude at that point was, like, fuck you, right. dude, we're in a comic con. <laughs> You know, like, I haven't slept in three days, yeah. you know, like, whatever. I just wanted to have fun and, like, you know, I think we, you know, we weren't supposed to, get, we weren't going to get paid and, like. And, and, yeah, and so then Trailer Park Kid came in. You, he started getting the best of you. I came in, beat him down, and then it was me, me, you, 
Chucky and Prezak, and then we start douching them with gold bond powder, <laughs> and then we start doing the can can in the middle of the ring, like with the gold bond powder going yeah. up, and like, and then Chucky Smooth, like, I think he, you know, because he used to be in a, a what was his fake rap group called? It was oh, like, I don't know. It's the Something Mafia. It was pretty sweet. Like we always, and he like, I know he came out. He's like gold bond mafia man. Like we're the mafia, and he was, and then fuck, we were the fucking gold bond mafia after that. And then, we were the hottest thing ever. <laughs> Here's uh, a couple pictures of me, Chucky. And Cabana at the Comic Con. It's, uh, of course, us with a stormtrooper. <laughs> uh, yeah, any picture opportunity. Not serious, like. Yeah. Um, then us with some of the X Men. And I had no clue who those guys. Like, yeah. I just, I think I saw the furry guy or someone else. Like, Dude, that furry guy. We gotta get and then uh, probably one of my favorite pictures that captures the friendship of a cult Cabana and, and CM Punk, and of course Scooby Doo. And look how young we are too. Yeah. Well, I guess we're not that young. You probably, you probably, probably look more. You look younger than me. I look like shit. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You got this one? Here we are? Mm -hmm. Alright, so here's here's the mafia. And then in this other picture of mafia we got here. Okay, so that's that's the Gold Bomb Mafia. That's the original mafia, the ones that uh, I think Adam Pierce worked his way into it because let's face it, Pierce knew he a good won. thing when yeah. he saw it. <laughs> um, uh, the the other um, unofficial member of the Gold Bomb Mafia, of course, if you asked any of us, she was not a member. But no. to her, this is her world. I couldn't even tell you her real fucking name. She is the Bikini Girl. Bikini Girl. That is strictly what we called her. And. When we first saw her, I'll be honest, me and Chucky Smooth were like, wow, this chick's totally hot, this chick's totally hot. And, you know, we'll tell us story how we eventually went, you know, we spent years with her. And she, at the end, she was the ugliest, most disgusting girl of all time. I was really I hated it. her. Everything that was about her was disgusting. But now, the fact that this proved the difference between some of the young guys growing up and, and, and some of the guys, we understood the work of it, you know, how it's a work, how it's a business. And we got this girl every single week to, with her van, family van, to drive us 300 miles every week and not putting one mile on our car and us knowing that, trying to not pay for gas as much as we could. And she loved, like she wanted to train, like maybe we got her in the ring once and you know made sure to hurt her so she'd be out another two months, but she'd still be with us because she was dedicated. And uh, the point is, and you know, this is, uh, is going to sound real degrading, but like most women in the business are rats. You know, I mean, and that's that's a hard fact of life that you will eventually realize. And it was like she got in the business, and I, you know, at the time she was like, oh, I want to be a wrestler and I want to train. I never saw her get in the ring. Right. You know, like it just never happened. And when we when we did get in the ring, all it took was like a good forearm shot, and then she, that was it. Yeah. She was done. You know, like so we always like kind of kept her in check, but. She would be bikini girl. She would wear a bikini and walk around the ring when the show started and take people's ring jackets and you know We'd sunglasses. Make sure that there was a spot for her, or yes. not a spot, but just whatever, so she could drive us and no one would be spending uh, putting miles on our cars. No miles on our cars. No right. gas out of our pocket. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Because it was like, you know, we weren't getting paid more than you know sometimes 30 40 right. 50 bucks from Ian and stuff like that and we certainly weren't getting trans right. so it was always just like me Chucky Cabana Prezac maybe occasionally somebody else but we'd always fill up that bikini van yeah. you know and drive it down and how many tickets would she get like none of sure. us would ever drive you know oh can one of you guys drive no you know I'm, I'm really tired I you know oh I just got off of work you know I, I mean that, that, that was that was, that was the thing where maybe somebody uh, a bunch of other young guys would probably just try to gang Banger and like that's the last you'd see of her. Like we we had tried to get blood from that stone and we yeah. squeezed her for like everything she was worth, you know. And she'd like, always have like snacks for us too. Yeah. Like yeah. Because she was <laughs> she's one of these girls who like you know her aspiration in life was to have a kid. She wanted to be a mom, so she thought she was like kind of the den mother, and we let her fucking believe that. Yeah, it was good. You know, evil. You know, blah blah blah. And yeah, and we would just randomly try to get her booked on shows whenever we could, just so we wouldn't have to. 
the drive. You every know? year, man, when, at that point, sometimes we went out three times a week because the goal was to work every weekend. And when no matter where, yeah, no matter how far, Ian worked out. Yeah, at the time, Ian was booking Wednesdays and Saturdays, and uh, and then he'd just go to Saturdays. So if there was no Saturday, you know, if we weren't doing St. Paul, if we weren't doing uh, Detroit, whatever, we'd go to Ian's. You know, if we weren't, and then all, and we start getting some of these AWA shows. Um, and then I got the, right. Are we, are we ready to segue here? A segue to the AWA, fake Dale Gagne. This dude called himself Dale Gagne. His real name is Dale Gagner. Great, great worker, though. Great businessman. Would book these sold shows for, like, casinos and Indian reservations and stuff like that when he would try to book, like, five guys. And the only way you'd really get booked is if you did a double gimmick. So you would, uh, like, Ace would wrestle as Ace Steel. Danny Dominion would wrestle as Danny Dominion and the Patriot. Ace would do Super Dolphin. Where he'd wear like Hardy Boy pants and like a super Delphin hood, you know, like um, there would always be somebody, uh, somebody would be a doink, somebody would be a Golga. Of course, me and Commander never stooped so low no. to be a doink or a Golga. And we won. I desperately wanted to do Conquistadors with him. Yes, Conquistadors was a money gimmick. And then eventually, Eric, and then that was before like New York's DW, he started like putting the Conquistadors back. Like, you know, it was like cool to remember, like, you know, how like, because it wouldn't like, it wouldn't be mean to like, you know, John Tent, like everyone was doing Gogo or whatever. But, you know, like, who fucking, you know, Conquista was rock and roll. Yeah, it's double hood. Let's do it. Yeah. And, uh, and then Eric Priest eventually bought it. But uh, we would be on the shows. So, like, we weren't on, like, all these shows. But when... I don't know when we got booked. Yeah, it was we like got booked on shows. So free school day. <laughs> it was. Nobody understands it. So, um... Was... Okay, so we did one show with, with, and then we'll go to to the the, the Michigan shot, the but the, the one with, Upper with, Peninsula with, uh, yeah, with uh, um, Sheik Adnan Al Casey, Al Casey, 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 whatever, whatever. I'm, I have an accent now. Uh, he was on the show, and, and uh, he, he didn't give a fuck, whatever. Yeah, and uh, they were turning him. He was gonna be a babyface this night. And this is at a carnival, by the way. Carnival in Minnesota, and he was gonna be a babyface. And we worked the night before, and we did like everyone did a singles, and we big, did a big tag, and he was our manager. I was all happy about him being the manager. <laughs> and, right, and then I think we we ribbed Danny Dominion. He came out to Popeye the Sailor Man. I remember that. But what was it like? We got in there, we did a couple arm drags, and he's like, "Take this fucker home." Yeah, like oh. <laughs> so he threw him out. Ace threw somebody out of the ring to get some heat, and <laughs> dude, he's loud as shit. He hits him with the sword one time. Boom, that's enough. Let's go home. Yeah. Like, you know, every time the heel would throw the baby face out so Adnan could get some heat, he wouldn't even do anything to him. He'd just pick him back up and throw him into the ring because he wanted nothing to do with it. He just wanted to go home. So Smooth. The next night he's on the show and, the, and Dale gets him. He's going to make him baby face, you know? And I mean, he came out, Justin Roberts, who's now a WWE uh, announcer, he was, the, he was the announcer and the sound man. And he's all bragging to me. He's like, you know, come on, come on. I got him coming out. You know, big pimping. He's going to come out to big pimping by Jay Z, yeah. where it's like, dun, 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 dun. and then that, yeah, in the beginning, because he had Iron Sheet coming out there too, or I guess it's kind of Arabian, I guess. Yeah, yeah that, that, I guess that whistle part, that's real, right. middle, that's real Middle Eastern. <laughs> and so, he comes out, and they have, and they have, do we show this first, or? Well, the shows, go ahead and show them, yeah, I'll talk yeah. for a second. The shows were at a carnival, so they had like a petting zoo, right? So like after me and Cabana worked and watched the debauchery of the Sheik coming out and trying to stand, start a USA chant, we'd walk around the carnival and we found the camel, <laughs> obviously. So we go, in, huh? we go running back and I grab the Sheik, I go, Sheik, there's a fucking camel. <laughs> You gotta come out with the camel. Are you fucking kidding me? I in my can't get on no cam my hip, I fall and I break my fucking hip, you you know, blah 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 blah. So he goes out to the ring and tries to stand at start a USA chant. I don't know, no rhythm or what, but this is the exact chant, Cabana. You I say you say you say you I say you say you say you say you say. He's just randomly saying the three letters like it was no U S A. Like people would try to catch on to what he was doing, and people would be going you. You say you say you say you say. And he's got the sword, and he's got the you know like that. Who's this guy thinking he's gonna be a baby face? You know. And I remember Ace working Skinny Doink. You remember Skinny Doink? Yeah, Marty. This dude, this random dude who looked like a janitor somewhere. Like he was just skinny. He looked like Iggy Pop. Like he was on heroin. You know, just real thin. You could see his bones and his veins. That was it. 
And uh, I remember sitting in the locker room. Who did I work? Maybe Noga. I, think I don't I, know. We worked each other. Did we? Yeah. Yeah, you were. I was big uh, heel, I think. Yeah, you were. You did the Colton. No, that was up in Michigan. No, well, whatever. I remember we worked. I think. I'm sick of working. Either. Yeah, he's uh, so. <laughs> I just remember Adnan, uh, you know, going, Hey, Steel, you don't work the doink. Doink, Marty, this is a Steel. If you cannot have a good match with a Steel, I cut my dick off. <laughs> right, right. It, like, Sheik was just such an outrageous character. Like, the stuff that came out of his mouth was just priceless. I loved it. I loved it. The, the best Dale Gagner show we ever did was in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Big 15-passenger van, mm-hmm. me, Cabana, Ace, uh, Danny, Noga. Butch McLean. Butch McLean. Big Butch McLean. Um, I don't know. This was the first weekend of college was starting, so I got picked up on the way up because it was through Michigan. I remember that. So like I didn't even get to go to the first party, and I didn't. Priest was there. This. Yeah, this was this. I didn't even need a college party because this weekend was unbelievable. This this weekend was absolutely sensory overload. Yeah. It was uh, the show was at a casino, um, and we stayed at this cottage type place. It wasn't like your normal hotel. It was like outdoor like cottages, you know. Like so when you drove down the street, there was like you know like the rooms of the the doors of the rooms were on the outside. You know, it wasn't like you're indoors. So we got a strip of rooms, and they were all next to each other. And the first night, it's like the first night we got there, um, we got there the night before our first show. So we got there, and we checked into our rooms, and I don't remember who was staying with who, but it was just like we just got there, and we were restless, you know? And we were at a casino, so it was like we got to go out to the casino, blah, blah, blah. Um, I could tell how the slips at the, at the counter. Oh, okay. clearly. Okay. That's how I made my money that weekend. <laughs> um... So we like check into the hotel and of course there's like, you know, two girls at the front desk. So we're like working them for stuff like that. The the deal would be one person would, you know, talk to the girls and, you know, just kind of distract them and the other person would pretty much just take everything that wasn't tied down. That's how me and Cabana would work. I, you, you still have the toaster, have the toaster in toaster. in your apartment. Yeah. yeah. Um I remember Four-way toaster. That's I remember uh they're having them having the free continental breakfast, you know, and I remember just taking all the bagels, you know. Yeah, like a Santa Claus sack. Yeah. Yeah, like I mean, I, just all of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, everyone else be damned. Um, we got into a bagel fight that weekend, of course, because, you know, we can only eat so many bagels. The rest just got thrown at each other. Um, I, the chronological order of all the debauchery I will not remember, but I will remember one, uh, I think the first night, like... You got, you, we went, when we checked in the hotel, there were slips. If you stayed there... You got you got, you got one you got one slip like the, the people at the hotel were supposed to give you one slip and you fill it out and you get five dollar uh, voucher for the casino. I took the whole book. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I took the whole book and you were supposed to have like the manager's initials or stuff like that. But I was like, well, how legit? Sure. You know, whatever. So as everyone else was getting like dressed up to go to the casino or whatever, shower and getting, I sat in the hotel room and filled out every single one <laughs> to where Cabana had a stack, yeah. I had a stack, and in the casino, there was like three different stations you can go to. So every ten minutes, I would go to the one station and I'd get my five dollars. And it was it was cash. It wasn't like a chip. It was like five dollars cash. Hooray, five dollars. I would immediately walk to the next station. Bam, bam. So I just got fifteen bucks. Fifteen minutes later, switch shirts with Cabana. Turn your hat back around. You know, you just go up there. You know, use an accent, whatever. I did this until like the entire book was gone or whatever. I made like a good. Seriously, like, you know, I remember Dominion, hey, how you guys doing? I'm 30 bucks up. And I was like, I got $180. <laughs> and he's like, holy shit, what did you play? I was like, I didn't play nothing. Like, I'm doing these, these slips, you know? Like, it's so the like, best game in the casino. Yeah, it's, it's like the, greatest, it's the greatest rip ever. Hey, everyone else is getting drunk and losing all their money, and, like, we were just scoring with these stupid slips, you know? Um, so, you know, our first night, we made some good cash. We didn't even wrestle yet. So we got back to the, the room. Nobody wants to sleep. Everybody's uh, Everybody's getting drunk. Um, was me and you in a room? 
Nogan, the, the important thing was Nogan and Butch McLean were in one room, and they're laying on the bed. So I get this idea to crawl through the ceiling <laughs> and to, to do something to them. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just know it's... Uh, your, our room's here. Their room is here. I just know it's, it's, it's pretty funny if somebody crawls through a ceiling to do anything to sure. somebody else. So I filled up the ice buckets with water, and uh, Ace helped us. Ace boosted me up there and, so. and handed me the water, and your job was to just... You just kind of walked into... By you just kind of walked into the room and yeah. got them in a specific spot yeah. for me to like just bomb them with this water. <laughs> so like Cabana's in there and I'm crawling on the ceiling and it's straight, straight up breakfast club where I'm bender and I'm crawling on this ceiling and it's it's like a drop ceiling. There's, I gotta make sure what I'm putting my weight on is sturdy and then I'm like sliding the things on <laughs> and Ace has got my feet the whole time just in case like I fall, you know. So finally I like get my car keys and I dig the like the corkboard gimmick and I slide it over just a little bit and I you know like I see where there's they're just Book McLean just lay down on the bed and Cabana's in the door of the hotel. Yeah, so what's up guys? <laughs> and Bush McLean's all like nothing. Bush McLean is six eight, used to play Texas AM. I think Texas AM. Six eight, three hundred pounds, straight up redneck, didn't like any you know He's big hillbilly. Yeah, big hillbilly. And Cabana's got nothing to say to him. He's like, So what are you guys doing? He's like, I'm I'm about to go to sleep. What do you want? <laughs> you know, Commander's like, yeah, how about that casino? Right. Oh, what are you doing? You know, blah, 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 as I'm maneuvering in the place. And just as, like, I pop the ceiling tile, throw it aside, Butch looks up, and he gets, like, three buckets of water, like, dumped <laughs> on him. And before, like, he can even know what happens, Cabana, you know, see you later, he, like, runs out the door, <laughs> locks the door. I, like, jump back in the room, and, like, it was the greatest thing ever, you know. I, I climbed through the ceiling and dumped <laughs> water on you. It may seem tame to, you know, to you, and it it's, you know, but it was pretty damn funny. Funny. Nogan was out that whole night drunk in the streets, I think, chasing after women. The yep. cops were called. And Eight, well, remember Ace got blitzed and it destroyed all the plastic lawn furniture? Oh, and then the cops came. Me and yeah. Dominion went to the store to get some food. And when we pulled back up, there was a lone cop car and just shattered plastic furniture all over. And Ace just sitting in the, the last chair that was left with a beer in his hand, <laughs> just looking all surly, like like this. And I don't even think the cop wanted to fuck with Ace. The cop didn't even want... The cop was just kind of like walking around, like surveying the damage. Like he was called to do something about Ace and as soon as he saw Ace just sitting there like this <laughs> looking around he didn't do anything so like we got Ace back in the room and blah 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 um, the next morning we, we were invited to stay another night Dale was like if you want to stay another night you're more than welcome like you don't have to leave then, this, is, this is all before we even wrestled yeah. which is like the most amazing thing the wrestling show itself is absolutely ridiculous Punk came out to uh, flash dance that I night dumped a, a cup of water on my head <laughs> okay. and did the, did the like the run in place and you know I had this ridiculous match with Ricky Noga my friend Cole Cabana here worked the Luminous Warrior Luminous Warrior is <laughs> just the biggest Ultimate Warrior times one point he's like fake Ultimate Warrior but yeah. this guy was so smooth because he was like this big jacked up guy and I remember our dressing room was like a, uh, a Winnebago yeah true. and I remember us sitting in there and Ace start going on about yeah hey Punk how about when we work out at the Belmont Powerhouse and all those Polacks in there don't know how to wear deodorant and they all smell like B.O. and those smelly Polacks and Polak this and Polak that and gets all quiet and Luminous War is standing there and he goes I'm Polish and Ace just goes sorry it's like real uncomfortable because Luminous War can like break Ace in half you know but we lay, his, lay, his last name is oh Jujinski 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 <laughs> Dominion had a field day with that so yeah we um and then I, I, I did a two minute match and I got my jaw like rewired from his clothesline it was like, and then I remember commandeering a, a golf cart and jousting with uh, George the Animal Steel we were driving this golf cart and Cabana had a, um, an orange cone yes. and then uh, I convinced George Animal Steel how great it would be if he rode to the ring on the golf cart <laughs> and then after the show we whizzed around the parking lot with him and we would randomly drive by each other and hit each other with the, the, the orange cones I built E was on the show. I remember, yeah, driving the golf cart around with Billy Eady. That was weird. So by working with Dale, actually, we got to wrestle with a bunch of names. Not wrestle, but be on shows with a bunch of names because he would always bring in. This was his meal ticket, you know, Iron Sheik, uh, George Steele, and then you know, and then Scruff, 
his other well his other names were you know Golga Golga and uh, Kimchi so but I can get you WWF guys and then right. he would bring in like one old school WWF guy like the Sheik I can get you Golga I mean he probably had fake Mankind fake Kane like if it was a hooded gimmick he would do it it was but just it was really an inspiration to me because I saw not in WWE and, and at this point you know the pays were, were really good you know not you know not good not it looked bad but good for you know that first time. year in the business second year in the business or whatever and uh, it was inspiration like especially at, at that point I'm going to college as a marketing major where this guy's making money like he's making money and uh, money was to be made if you're not Vince McMahon and that was kind of my, my at least my first eye opener that you could actually make money in wrestling and, it, and I wasn't saying I wanted to be a promoter but you could just see that the know, potential was there, there to be was, you yeah. know like everyone always said there's only one game in town but right. it was like if you played your cards right and you're smart business wise you can make some coin business you know business yeah you just gotta see the opportunity um, we would I think we were known for goofing off a lot yeah and especially like once we started getting more of a name and like you said earlier about getting too big for our britches and like then we would go back and we would do some scrub shows like these one shot deals and we would treat it like totally as a joke <laughs> you know like like we are big superstars or something um, and we would roll through and like just do whatever we wanted and this and this and that I remember was it uh, one time in Michigan we did. Uh, we were involved in a big battle royal, and uh, Brian Gorey used to work with the Insane Clown Posse doing the Juggalo Championship Wrestling. Brian Gorey had four doink outfits <laughs> from the, the Insane Clowns. Um, so it started off as a total rib to obviously uh, let's have this battle royal and everybody will wear a doink outfit and then get eliminated and then come back as yourself, you know, whatever. So, but I had hooked up. This was, I think, it was my hookup through Jeff Hill. So he was like really high on me, and I was his champion. So I was kind of like main event guy or whatever. So this is the reason why I couldn't really participate because I think I was going over the battle royal with Cole Cabana. And I was kind of pissed off because I really wanted to participate. He wanted but, to be a doink. Yes, I did. But I think I was captain of the doinks that day, and yes. you know, he, and he was just showing that. And this is, <laughs> this is. You can't beat that right there, no. ladies and gentlemen. In here, I try to be happy in this one, but <laughs> look at me. CM Doink. Look at me. <laughs> Chuck Smooth was a doink. I was a doink. Uh, I think Gavin Starr was a doink. That was gorgeous his claim to fame. I think. Gorgeous Gavin <laughs> Starr. No, Gorgeous Gavin Starr's claim to fame was he was. <laughs> Sorry to call you out, buddy. Sorry to call you out, Gavin Starr. But as you once told Ace Steel on a trip no, to no, no, it was me and Chucky. Was it you and yeah, Chucky? Me and Chucky. Because oh. his first time to the Sweet Science. Okay, so you're asking Gavin Starr like well, Chucky's more berating because Chucky's having well, a great time berating him. What what kind of a wrestler are you? Like, what's your style like? What do you do? Uh, well, I kind of like Shawn Michaels. Uh, more like Shawn Michaels, but with more charis more charisma. Yeah, Gavin Starr. Yeah, this is cool. I'm like Shawn Michaels with more charisma. Holy shit. Yes. <laughs> and that's, I mean, you're a pretty good wrestler. Who is the fourth doink? Gort. Gort, yeah, Gort. you're right. And so, like, it was ridiculous. Like, Highlander, this big, gigantic, fat dude, like, that came in and soul. clotheslined all four doinks over the, the top. And then Jimmy Jacobs was on the show, and he you did, you did a doink spot in the ring, though. Oh, we did the whole, yeah. we did the whole here, 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 four. and then like <laughs> two doinks like kicked the other two in the balls, and then turned to each other and did that. You know, like it was just ridiculous. I suggest to try to get the tape. Oh, I don't think I don't know if there is a tape. Is there a tape? I, I remember watching it on tape. Oh, if anybody man. has it, it's praise act. So. <laughs> um, I remember Jimmy Jacobs being there, and this was still when I hated his guts and I would torment him. And he just got his nipples pierced, so he made it this big thing to run around the locker room and go, "I just got my nipples pierced. Don't chop me. Don't chop me." So. The, of course, I chopped the shit out of him, you know, and what are you going to do? And anytime anybody asks not to chop you, you chop him. Uh, but the time we got kicked out of Canada. Canada? Um, I, I somehow, uh, I, I befriended this guy named Kevin Harvey, and uh, he was, a, he, and he was an announcer, and it's so hard for an announcer to do stuff. You know, there's one announcer on these shows, half the time they don't want to pay you, you know, so like, you know, it's hard for an audience, and he forgot this good gig in Canada. Like, and, and, uh, and finally, there was this big show, it was like right when Lawler and the Cat kind of got rid from WWE, and right when ECW split, so it was a big show, a thousand people in Toronto, um, uh, Lawler, Roadkill and Doring with those belts they had, you know, it was, it was a bit Carino, and then uh, the Cat, and I, there might have been somebody else, but... Uh, 
Uh, so 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 Harvey got us me and Punk as the opener on the show, and it was gonna be cool. We're you know we're gonna wrestle in a different country. It's gonna be really cool. You know even though it's you know America Junior, but uh, so me <laughs> so. Uh, uh, it was my 21st birthday, and we were going to do Canada, and then go down to XICW, and I get that. Is he looking at that picture? Well, whatever. But, uh, Which one? So we go up to Canada. So Punk rents, uh, like, they just came out. What was that car? I remember what it was. Uh, uh, P- PT Cruiser. PT Cruiser. And it was really, because he, he had this hookup rental, like, where he can get rentals for really cheap. And, and so it was all smooth using the PT Cruiser. We meet in uh, Michigan. Uh, then we go up to Canada, and, uh, you know, we didn't really know the rule. I guess you, you got to, you know, you can't work. You can't. You need a work permit. We didn't know anything. I was just gonna go over the border and yeah. wrestle. I didn't know. So and I, to this day, I blame you for it. I blame you. Well, I, and I'll no. show you. How I bl- I'll tell you how I blame. Okay. Because I had gone to Windsor before, and we just go in, and they're like, "Why are you here?" And we're like, hey, "We're going. To, we're going to party and have a good time." They're like, "Okay." And so we go in, and they're like, "Why?" You know, we go to the border. Why are you here? You know. And Kevin Harvey's like, "Ah, oh, we're gonna go see some casinos." Or, we uh, formulated a plan. It's Kevin Harvey's fault. Okay. No. Truthfully. But we formulated a plan. Well, okay, well, we all need to have the same story. We yeah. all need to say, you know, and what was the story we came up with? We were with? in college, right? Or we just... I thought it was going to be like charity show, wasn't it? No. Or no, we, that were, was after we were training. The... We were training. No, we were in college because this is why we were, go- this is why we were going through the border. I swear, and this is probably why um, we got kicked out because we can't even get our story well, straight now. Well, I blamed, if you go through the border and they say no, they take you to the side. The reason I, I think it was because we said we were college kids and I, and I was like, no way, look at Punk, he's got tattoos, he does look like college Well, we kids, clearly told him three different, different like, stories, <laughs> you know, like, you know, I figured, I, I thought I was like, I, I thought I was Hannibal from the A-Team, and I was like, here's the plan, guys, we're going to tell him we're training, because if they ask for his gear, we'll just tell him Jerry Lawler is going to train us for the day, we're obviously not wrestling, we're not getting paid, we have to pay them, because we all had cash on us, we had a flyer for the show that said Jerry Lawler on it, blah, 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 and I remember just getting pulled aside, I mean, we got Chicago plates, um... Kevin Harvey's got a Michigan license, you know, you got a Kalamazoo college license, you know, like whatever. I got I got a Chicago license, blah blah blah. And we all get pulled over and like, you know, Kevin Harvey's got a tuxedo. <laughs> You know, Sharpies. we got gear. I remember having a, a, a hand here. I probably got a. I probably got one in my pocket right now. Multivitamin, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I had. Uh, we were gonna be gone for like three days, so I had three of them in my pocket. The lady grabs them and, and she goes, "What are these?" And I was like, "They're multivitamins." She's like, "I've been taking a multivitamin for 14 years, and mine don't look like this." And I was like. Jesus, Jesus Christ, like what? I'm, I'm sorry, you know? And then she pulled out a Sharpie from my bag and she's like, and what's this for? For writing, I don't know, like, you know. I'm, and you had like 40 Sharpies yeah. in your bag too, and then they're like, was this a Sharpie party? Or like, they were really sketched out about the Sharpie. So the, the way I'm pretty sure it rolled downhill is when you asked me, what are you here for? And I said, I'm here for pro wrestling training. I remember them looking, and Kevin Harvey was sweating bullets, like you, yeah. you think he's smuggling drugs. He goes, I'll take care of this. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. My friend's getting married, and we're going over to celebrate and go to casinos. Yeah. And I was just like, ah. And I remember her pulling out your boots. Yeah. What are these shiny boots for? And you going, we're going to go clubbing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just went, oh, fuck. Sex. There's three different people. Sex costumes. <laughs> three different stories. So they took us in this room, and they started, I don't know, processing us or whatever. And uh, I remember you had to piss real bad. We probably all did, but you were the one who asked, can I go to the bathroom? No. And I was like, jeez, like that was pretty rude. And I was drinking like a Diet Pop or something like that. So I had this empty, and we're waiting around, and we're waiting around, and I go, hey, you got a garbage back there? You throw this out. And the lady looks up, and he goes, go throw out your garbage in your own country. <laughs> By this time, we're laughing. That was like, it, man. That's the greatest thing ever. You know, and finally it was like, well, are we in trouble or what? You know, can we leave? And, and I it, had three, two fake IDs on me, too. <laughs> I know if you have in Canada, it's like you go to jail. Yeah. And like, you were nervous, and I remember I started oh, fucking wow. talking shit, and you're yeah. all like, calm down. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then we, 
I had to go throw my garbage out in my own country. Yeah, they turned so we, us around. We had to turn around. But the weekend was saved because we went back to Kalamazoo. Yeah. And there was parties everywhere. So we'd walk into these parties. And even if we didn't know people, it's like we'd walk in and crash the party. Oh, yeah. And I remember clearing out a frat house of 16 four-cartridge Mach 3 Gillette razors. Yep. I cleared out every fucking bathroom that I went into. <laughs> like, I had Gillette Mach 3s for days. <laughs> Like, like what we do at parties is we go to people's uh, rooms and we take <laughs> we just take their shit. But like I don't drink, I just stock up everything and <laughs> show the picture of us on the the golf cart. Oh, okay. It was it was in there. This was uh, this was when I think it was a different show. That was X Fest in Indianapolis. Yeah. And then here coming here is and then the next day we went and did Malcolm Monroe's the Junior <laughs> XICW. Here I'm tw we're 21. This is my 21st birthday. It was glorious, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. It was very appropriate that I worked you on your 21st yeah. birthday in a bar. In a bar. In a bar in front of 30, like... In the worst ring ever. Yeah, everyone has glorious 21st birthdays. That was mine. Well, speaking of, you know, it's one thing about the wrestling business, obviously, is like, you know, your milestones and the important things are pretty much footnotes, and everything takes a, a backseat to your career. Every Thanksgiving, we would wrestle for Ian. So probably going on five years now, I have not been home with right. my family for Thanksgiving. My family's Cabana, Prezac, you know, and every year, me being the sentimental guy that I am, I would want to take a picture with everybody that we ate Thanksgiving breakfast with. And Thanksgiving breakfast was always at a Cracker Barrel, and we would pull every single busboy <laughs> and waitress and whoever we could, and we probably got like five or six Cracker Barrel pictures. Probably the same Cracker Barrel, different people every single yeah. time, except for like me and Cabana, uh, Prezac, there's sure. Ace in that one, Chucky, and of course, you know, Bikini Girl, because she thought she was, she, she was, thought she, she, was, was our, she was one of us. She was our, our chariot. Um, here's some more stuff. This is Suicide Kid, me, Punk, and Suicide Kid hanging out. Who, you know, I, like when we say, when you say, you know, we all kind of bit our teeth to get into wrestling, me, you, BJ, the hero, Suicide Kid was another one, and he got hurt, unfortunately, and I, and I think he'd be in the Ring of Honor rings today, and, you know, we would have weaseled him in or something, or whatever, but he would have no, proved his point, and he would have been right there with us. Well, Commander's going to show you that picture, and I'm going to show you this picture of us with hot chicks. Hot chicks. Because that's how we roll. And here's Punk, me forcing him to do something, sorry. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, that uh, that hoodie is probably uh, worn by one of Ian's children right now because I remember leaving it over there one day, one day and I was real pissed and I'm still mad about it. I want my hoodie back. Here's more f just me and Punk on the road. Like, uh, I was, I, and this is, a, I think, um, it was like a huge snowstorm and uh, in Minnesota and we said, fuck, let's drive the night before. So we drove, I think it was 11 hours in the car. It took, we got there and the show was canceled and, and I was the happiest guy because Ed Hellier took us out for breakfast. Like we got free breakfast and he bought it. And so like, hey, I it. feel real bad yeah. you guys drove all this way and I'll take you out for breakfast. So I got God damn breakfast. right, you're taking us out for breakfast. Um, more hot women. Hot women. Because that's how I roll. That's me and uh, my friend, Gorgeous George. More hot women. <laughs> that bitch is the greatest. <laughs> Show that one again, dude. Like, I don't remember who that is. I don't know what's going on with that picture, except clearly my obvious disgust for that woman, whoever she is. Um, here's me as a... Uh, toxic Avenger. Toxic Avenger. Here's, a, here's another one of my old friends. <laughs> Who's that? Nadia Nice is in there. God. She was a uh, good looking lady, that girl. Uh, yeah. Oh boy. Hot me and hot women. So a lot of a lot of the people Sherry was awesome. Um, she would do Carmines and Ian's and she she I mean like we got to you know Yeah, sensational Sherry pinned me a good three times. <laughs> That's good. Um yeah. how about not hot women? What about Kamala Jr. Jr. Kamala Jr. Jr. And that's a funny story. And I like to tell the Pondo story. Nate Webb and Madman Pondo right there. And uh, this white kid who wore a Kamala hood. And it was we probably... we got to tell who Kamala Jr. Jun Kamala Jr. is like this big thing in Indianapolis. And he's like a big joke. I don't know. Is he a big joke? No, he used to promote that. I don't know. What Kamala the fuck do you think? Well, <laughs> no, but, that was, but then... So he wasn't Kamala Jr. 
Jr., he was Kamala Jr. Jr. with a white hood. And then that night, I think we watched, I, either, I don't know if it was that night, it was in Indianapolis, and I watched Mad Mad Pondo, and he doesn't drink. But he got nailed this one night, and he cut this awesome, he was going to do the hardcore stuff. He gets in the ring, you know, no one was there. He's like, I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to do this. This is going to be the most extreme thing. You're all going to love it. It's going to be unbelievable. He goes, but first, I got to piss. And so he takes the, either I go with him, or there's a camera with there's him. There's a camera with him. There's a camera with him. And before he does it, he's in, he's hammered, and he's walking to the, to the, you know, out of the armory and into the, and they're showing him taking a piss, going, "I'm gonna kill this guy. <laughs> it's the most extreme thing you've ever seen in your life." And he's like, he's pissing it up, and uh. And then that night, I went to all to do... Uh, well, what was the punchline? The punchline was, like, he was in the ring beating this guy up, and he's all like, I peed and didn't wash my <laughs> hair! <head." Yeah. laughs> like, it's <just> like... <laughs> and it was the greatest thing ever. Talk about old friends and some good times. Here's some people we came up with. Chris Hero is Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Me, looking very skinny and spry, and uh, Ace Steel's head. That's how you punch that fan. Which one? The one. No, Hero punched a fan. Nah. Yeah. It was uh, you and Ace against me and Hero. We were, it was St. Andrew's Hall. The eight Mile! Ow. Eight Mile! That's where all that Eight Mile shit took place in that basement. Um, really? Yeah, man. Remember the basement? Remember the club? I didn't know that. Yeah, man. That's that's Eight Mile. Okay. Eight Mile. Ow. Eight Mile. <laughs> uh, so we're set to work, and I remember me and Hero really healing up with a group of black guys. And they're all rowdy, and they're into it, so we're like, let's pick this corner, and we can really work these guys. They look like they're they're into it. And it wasn't so much that they were smart marks, but they were just they looked like they were into it and having a good time. Yeah. They were cheering the baby faces and booing the heels. Well, I got up into one guy's face, and I was crossed this guardrail, do this, do that, and I'll never forget the guy goes, I'm going to throw a punch, duck. <laughs> and I just went... <laughs> like Scooby Doo, like wait, 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 what? And I was like, dude, don't do it. And like he throws this big, like fake ass haymaker. It's not a real punch by any means, right? But I like reached up and I like I grabbed him by the back of the hair. And before I can even like say, oh, you just made the biggest mistake. Like in the pocket, here comes Chris Hero. Like I got the guy and I got his fist up here, and Hero comes through my arms and just. <laughs> socks the guy right in the face and I'm like oh Jesus and I just react so I pull the guy like over the rail all the other guys are like trying to come over security's coming over <laughs> Hero's like socking people and it was just like it just turns into like this big fight bam 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 it's like all over they all get carted out and we're all just using it for heel I'm like that's right anybody else that wants a piece you can step over the guardrail come on and I remember turning around and Ace just standing in the ring just going <laughs> Like what have I created? Like what the hell? And at this point, you like you and Chucky were really known for like fighting people in the crowd. That was well. Remember, that was the I had the the fan hat trick. I got uh, the excuse me the fan fight hat trick. In different cities, though. Well, the, that was the one in Detroit. Um, there was one in Wisconsin at at the Greyhound uh, the Dairyland Park where I I socked the guy from the Navy, <laughs> and then I kicked him in the ribs. And then they and he made the coolest he made the coolest noise. It was like it was just like <laughs> it was like the greatest thing ever. I kicked him so hard in the ribs. I socked him in the face and he went down and I punted him in the ribs. And I remember turning around and his two friends were like, whoa, I don't want no trouble. And I turned back around and just started like kicking <laughs> in their fish. Kicking yeah. their friend, yeah. you know, like and, and skull crusher, big six foot eight black man runs out of and just starts fucking people up. Um and there was another one. It was in Milwaukee, I think, for Carmine's, no? In oh, that was uh, that was, well that was Carmine's. But Chucky was on a midget show and he beat somebody up. I remember that. He beat this old 40-year-old up or something, and Chucky's like 5'7", like 150. I don't know, but it was awesome. Yeah, I got in the yeah, It was bad, bad. <laughs> bad for business. So, um, here's another one. This is awesome. Uh, we raffled off a lap dance. And this is how dumb we are, because I, I was thinking about this. this. He, this broad, we were, like, this was pretty cool. Like, we raffled off, and... I believe her name, her name was Back Row Beezy. Back Row Beezy. She'd always buy a, a general admission ticket to Ian shows and sit in the back row. And he sold, I think, like $200 with raffle tickets. Yeah. And we were such marks for doing the, the dance that we didn't even bother to take a cut of it. Well, like, and the gimmick was I remember her spending an entire paycheck. Like, she had just got paid. Yeah. Friday or Saturday night, she just got paid. And, you know, however much it was, $150, 200 bucks from whatever job she worked, right. she put the entire check yeah. towards... 
this lap dance to make sure that she was the, the name that got picked. And we did it twice. And the first one, I think, was Freaks Come Out at Night we danced to. Yeah. But the second one was... Um, Two Life Crew. What was it? Welcome, Welcome to the Fuck Shop. Welcome to the Fuck Shop. And I, that was always... Big <laughs> gump. <laughs> Welcome to the Fuck Shop. Somebody needs to use that in yeah. the music. It's so smooth. No. <laughs> um, that, that shows how, like, just how, like, uh, Ian's was, how we all learned, but there was so much fun and different memories we had from IWA. Let's see if you can remember this. This is when uh, Pondo got absolutely shit-faced and there's Colt yeah. Cabana singing uh, karaoke. Karaoke. Worst rendition of what song did you do? I think, uh... Gambler or something? Oh, you didn't know the words at all. You thought you knew the words, sure did. and shit sure started did. scrolling up, yeah. and you were just like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> I'm the embarrassing guy, and then Punk busted out like the greatest edition of "I'm Just a Gigolo." I think. I, and I did Roadhouse Blues. Oh, you fucked that one up. Man. Yeah, of course. Um, traveling through airports is always probably the funnest thing. And Norm Connors, props to Norm for being the, the first first guy, first guy to ever buy a cabana and myself a plane ticket. Yeah. And I remember pretty much, you know, living in like the Pittsburgh airport for a while like you know we dogs go to Quiznos after. yeah I always go to Quiznos you know <laughs> staying in the airport plaza hotel knowing the girls who work there and yeah. getting hooked up on stuff I remember one time walking through uh, the Pittsburgh airport it's just a, again, another good time it's just, just randomly yeah. walking through the airport and I come on fucking Waldo and you're like what I'm like where's Waldo like the guy in the book look it's him here take a picture for me and I remember just randomly now the, the set the scene I randomly just run up to this guy stand next to him and posed ow it just hurt my elbow ah so this guy has no clue what's going on Where's Waldo? Oh, they found him. I found him. I found him. Fucking so if you want to know where Waldo, he's at the fucking Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh airport. airport. Yes. Many other other goodies you get. Um, I got you at a gas station in St. Paul, Minnesota, with a, with a parrot on your shoulder and somebody's thumb, obviously. It's a parrot. Remember, we walked into this gas station and there was like a random guy with a parrot on his shoulder. So we all got to play with the the parrot. You and Mixel Plick. <laughs> oh wait, here's the. Did you show a picture yeah. of the lap dance? Yeah, there's another one. Here's another picture of the lap dance. Look how not sexy I am. <laughs> I'm the whitest man on earth. Um, all right, here's a picture from Minnesota, and I think this is a good rib story if you all want to hear it. Um, this no. is the Mall of America, and uh, we're going through the mall. I think I was really crabby that day for some reason. I was really pissed off, and like um, everyone was having a good time, and I was kind of pissed off, and all of a sudden we concocted, we saw this, and it was, do you know, remember the name of the store? It had to be like Beads Are Us. Beads Are Us, I think it was, and we concocted this plan. I don't know, I can't take credit for who had the plan or whatever, but somehow so we set it and I, and I go in and Ace and, and Punk are um, outside the door of the mall and a good like 20 feet away both looking and, and their, their gimmick was to look like like that's the gimmick like huh like well, I want to know the answer and like, I we, sent, we sent one person in to find out the answer to our question and, and, and me, and Ace, most me and Ace were basically sitting there going like this like I had the most I had the most uh, not to crack up I think and so I look I look and I'm and I'm like I'm looking on the store and I make sure to get the girl's attention at the front desk and, and you know like I look and I go to look, uh, ask her a question and I back off and, I'm, and we get, you know we want to get a, 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 some mileage out of it and I look and, and then I go up to her and I go and then uh, and she said what's up honey you know, and he's you? looking out at us yeah, and we're, we're doing the go 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 ask, do you, do ask. You have it? Oh. and I, I go you know beads are us I go do you do you guys do you guys sell anal beads you know, and she, what? And she's like, well, and I think I said softly, like, "You guys sell anal beads?" And she's like, "I can't hear you." And I was like, "I didn't want to say it." And I played out, "Do you guys do you sell anal beads?" And she's like, "No." And then that was you know, that's hilarious. And then the punchline is, is that I look over them and I go, I go. And we all hang our heads. And they hang their heads. I kicked the flower pot like next to me, you know, like this lady was just like horrified, yeah. like, oh my, oh my god. <laughs> like, and I walk out, and that was like a, a big hey, for us. Remember the Mall of America, and they had that wrestling stand there. Remember? Remember? That no. sold videotapes. There was a certain wrestling company that had. No, I don't. That had. Yes, you do. You remember talking to the guy who worked there who didn't know we were workers, and so we started asking him every single annoying, yes, mark okay. question okay. in the world. Like, you know, we said, "Hey, we heard the uh, or the you know we heard the Ultimate Warrior was dead," and the guy'd be like, "No, he's still alive." We'd be like, "Oh, we heard there was like three Ultimate Warrior <laughs> and like okay. all this ridiculous stuff," and then he's showing like Japanese wrestling on the TV, and we're like, "What's this? Oh, it's Japanese wrestling. They have wrestling in Japan," and like so we just. just just annoyed the shit out of him and asked him all kinds of fun questions. Fun time. Fun.
The hair, that know. hair is that hair is awesome. It's kind of a faded looking picture, but faded. Not a steal. That is me. Boom. And that was when we were doing those dating shows for IWA, and then one of the dating shows was uh, me, Punk, and Eddie Guerrero in front of 30 people. 30 people for Eddie Guerrero. <laughs> and I had an asthma attack also. And Eddie almost beat the tar out of that kid in the crowd. Yes. The kid made like some pill comment, and Eddie like, oh my God, Eddie was like the most, he's so intense. He just stared that kid down, that kid's soul like leapt out of his body. Yeah, it was awesome. People. Yeah, but we also had our, our silly Iron Man match where we, we forgot the, the number of falls. Um, we were pretty sure you were ahead because you were supposed to go over. <laughs> okay. So we did the obligatory um, super indie fish out of water spot where, you know, it's like roll up one, two, roll up one, two, roll up one, two. Except every single time he pinned me, I just let the ref count to three because we forgot <laughs> the fall count. So he wound up beating me like 19 to seven, like something really ridiculous, you know, like eh, it's something nobody ever does. Right, yeah. So I wanted to do it, you know. You and Short Dog. Oh, I was some midget. <laughs> short Dog, and I'll tell you the thing. It's supposed to see all the people back there. There's like 14,000 people, I guess, at the X Fest. Who's playing uh, Lincoln Park, I think? I don't know. Lincoln Park. Mud Mudvayne. Yeah, I don't know them, any of them. But, uh, and, the, you know, everyone, like, I remember it was like Punk got to work Ace, and everyone was working on these guys, and I, and I got, like, I kind of was, like, left out or something, and, like, I kind of was upset, and, I, like, I wanted to work Kickboxer because or something, and, and Short Dog was there for the midgets, and I was like, I don't want to work fucking Short Dog. And they're like, you serious? I was like, yes, and I go, I'm putting them over. And so, <laughs> you showed them. Yeah. And, like, and then, you know, it's one of my greatest achievements, and, like, the finish was like, um, oh, I think, you know, Short Dog went through my legs, I throw a clothesline, a regular clothesline, and he just keep on running, and then I was a heel, yeah. And then, uh, and then I, and then all of a sudden I gave this mean drop kick and I like, kicked the shit out of him. I started beating the fuck out of him, like just because I wanted to beat up a midget. And uh, and it was awesome. And then the finish was I pick him up. Hero comes in. And I go here, have a midget. And then he catches him. And then he goes, you know, no, you take him. We start throwing this him around. And, and then all of a sudden I catch him again. And he drop kicks me. And I and I take the bump. And he won. And then Prezak runs in one two three. And then everyone was really happy. And then Hero hurt Prezak, didn't he? Did he? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, he did that weird move. Oh yeah 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 yeah. He did some. Hero. There's another one of my favorite pictures. Looking back on it, and this uh, is a great picture. This is a, this is smooth as hell. It sums it up. This is this is the one that's going to be in the magazines when like you know when people are doing retrospective of Colt Cabana or CM Punk. Like you know they were friends for years and you know and finally at WrestleMania 26 you know it all comes to a head. Blah blah blah. Yeah right. At, at Sweet Science 16 2019. <laughs> you have your dreams. I have mine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the date on this one's 10 27 01. So. It was a day after my birthday four years ago. That is a money picture. That's right. You're Marty Gennetti, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow. Wait a second. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Diamond? Wow. No. I got no more good pictures. You out of pictures? Nah, well, pretty much. I mean, let's. You really want to explain Mixel Plick. What other. Uh what about Virgil at the at the pit, at the card show? What about Virgil every time I see Virgil? I recently just saw Virgil at the Philadelphia Wizard World Comic Con. Every time I see Virgil, ow, hurt my elbow. It's always about, hey, punk, how you doing? I'm good, Virgil. Yeah, that's good. I'm doing real good. I'm making lots of money, man. I'm making lots of money, man. You staying busy? Yeah, I'm fairly busy. Yeah, that's good, man. I'm wrestling all over the place, you know. And he, I never hear Virgil wrestling anywhere. And I like Virgil. He's a nice guy. But like, he's like the the, the epitome of like Carney to me. Like, Which you know. Excellent, by the way. Oh yeah, there's I nothing wrong with it. Like, he's always just, he's a mover. He's a shaker. He's doing this. He's doing this. He works for the this guy. He works over here. He, you know. And he's probably an example of somebody who made a shitload of money back in the day and probably doesn't have a dime to show for it because he shows up at every single baseball card. He's always got the biggest banner that says WWF star Virgil. He'll bring a little TV and he'll constantly show his match with Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase on it and like, you know, um, I rem he, you know, you ever work Japan? Yeah, I work Japan. Who you work for? I work for Zero One. I never heard of that, man. If you want to make money in Japan, you got to work for Inoki. And the great thing about Virgil is 
if the camera was, you know, me, he's never looking me in the eye. Virgil's always looking for somebody Something's cooler to talk on. to Something's or going. something better to do. He's like, oh yeah, man, yeah, you know, you want to make money, you gotta, you gotta go work for a Noki, man. You know, you know, we're make million dollars working for a Noki. You know, and he, like he just wants to get out of the conversation, but he's the one who started it with me. So like, whatever, you know. And uh, I mean, I saw Virgil at the. What was it? The, the Oh, man, I can't even remember what the name of the convention was called. The horror convention that it's in New Jersey. Horror convention? Fuck. Convention Chiller Con. Convention. Chiller Con. And I went to Chiller Con. Oh, and horror. And, and the boss was there. And Raven was there. And come on by, kid. And come on by. I'm signing autographs. Yeah, you check me out. You know? Yeah. Come say hi. So it's Raven, Virgil, Lollipop was there. I think that's probably why I went. Um, um, Great. We're just friends. Yeah. We're just pals. High fives. Uh, high fives. Uh, and what's her name? Missy Hyatt. So I'm talking to Pop, and Franny was there, Francine. So Francine's all happy to see me. Francine and I'm talk- to you and I. Franny. Franny. <laughs> Franny to me. I don't know. We're just friends. And uh, I'm talking to Franny, and I'm talking to Pop, and um, Missy Hyatt's eating food, and she gets done with it, and she goes, "Ah, can you go throw this out for me? And I turned, and I looked at her, and I was like, absolutely not. (laughs) And I turned around, and I kept talking to Franny, and Missy Hyatt starts in on me, like, who the fuck do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, who the fuck do you think you are? And, like, I started getting all hot, and Raven's all like, ah, kid, you know, yeah, you should show some respect, blah, blah, blah. And, like, respect for what, you know? And, like, so later on, she was like, um, I didn't know you were in the business, you know. I mean, that's how you treat people. Yeah, and I was like, right. but that's how you treat people? You just randomly, hey, go throw out my garbage? Anybody not in the wrestling business. I mean, you can fucking be- throw out your own garbage. Yeah. And she started uh, healing. She tried to, like, since I was fighting with her, she tried to somehow turn around on Pop and yell at Pop and just say all this crazy stuff about how I was the first diva and if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be in this business and blah, blah, blah. And Lollipop's all like, well, you're just a rat. And then I'm thinking, well, you fucking showed your tits on TNA, you know, like... I had, you know, I was in the middle, you know. So, yeah, like, I remember Pop had to stay in her room, so I was like, absolutely not. You're not staying here. And Missy Hyatt's room was so creepy. She had Post-it notes everywhere. There's one on the TV. There's two on the mirror. There's one on the door. There's one on the bathroom mirror. Everywhere you went, it was like, I'm serious. No, serious. It was like, because there was like a marathon in New York the next day, so it was always like, remember marathon. There's a marathon, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, there's one in the pillow. There was one everywhere. Um, I think I was wearing a hat when I walked in the room. Right. She's like, oh my God, take your hat off, take your hat off. You can't wear your hat when you're in my room. And I'm like, eh, you can suck 16 dicks, but I can't wear a fucking hat in your hotel room. Good Lord. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just the guy. I don't know. Wow, awesome. Yeah, there's, I don't really know Missy Hyatt, but, you know, uh, I don't think I would get along with her. <laughs> What else we got, Banna? Wow, uh, that's that's a good one. Um, <laughs> well, so where else did we go? Um, the question, the question guy. <laughs> now, Me and Cabana were told to sit in front of this camera and just talk. So that's why that's what you're getting. We have no questions. Yeah. Uh, Does anybody in the room have any questions? Anybody? So what? Some minutes. How about the? Uh, one of my favorite stories, and I guess it's hard to present, is. Um, like again, we were young and uh, Pierce, and we're in the car, and the, the big thing is to water bomb people, and we got you know the water. Everyone's squeeze water bottles, and, and once Brad was back there, and I think I fucking army crawled the back and just boosh the fuck out of him like a whole half of water. It was it was freezing cold out too. I remember yeah. this is like the height of Brad's uh, weird thyroid yeah. disease, <laughs> and it's freezing cold out. And Brad, we forced Brad to ride all the way in the back because we were like, you can't sleep, but I'm tired. You can't sleep, I'm tired. Fine, then you got to sit with the luggage. So Brad's in the very First back, that trip. little space of the van with luggage, and he's laying on the luggage, and he somehow passes out, man. He's First asleep. Trip, he's sleeping. Yeah, and it's it's like below zero outside. Yeah. We're we're traveling through uh, uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and stuff like that. So like we're like, don't sleep, don't sleep, and he falls asleep. So we water bomb him, fucking, you know, and like he gives the exact opposite response that's appropriate. Like he freaks out, and throws a fit. <laughs> And starts bitching about it. Like, if he laughed it off, you know, like sure. he just didn't know how to handle himself. Yeah. Fucking assholes. Oh, I'm an, a- I'm an asshole. He's the one who water bombed you. Why are you I calling me an asshole? Water Have water. some water. <laughs> you know, and then like I water bombed him, then Pierce water bombed him, then Ace water bombed him. Brad is soaking wet <laughs> in freezing below temperatures, riding in the back of the van. 
clacking. He's so skinny. He's like just shivering. And we water bottled him for seven hours straight. That's, you know, we, he probably could have died, realistically, with this thyroid problem and the hypothermia <laughs> really? we were attempting to. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that's attempted murder in some countries. Well, I'm then, sure. And then we're going to another, another time, and I have my dad's van. We stop in Walmart, and I'm driving. And we come up with the, me and Pierce come up with this concoction. And all of a sudden, I ride up to the guy, and my big, I don't know, I, I ride up to the guy and go, excuse me, sir. So you're going to stop and ask for directions? Yeah. Do, do you know where I can buy some chaps? And the chaps to me are just hilarious and awesome. It's a funny word. Yeah, it's a good for chaps. <laughs> and uh, it's like, oh, no. And then Pierce pops out from the fucking top of the sunroof with like an extra big, and douches this guy in fucking water, drenched. And we don't scoot out right away. Like, I, we stand, we just look at him, make eye contact, and he goes, like for a good five, ten seconds, then we split out, and like that was just that summed up just the fucking fucking with people. Ace would always get out of the car, and what would he have the fucking weird sunglasses or the weird glasses with the googly eyes? He would, he would just get out of the car and start fucking knocking on people's windows. I, I can't. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, ask for directions and yeah. Uh, and uh, do you know where Nutsick Road is? <laughs> Nutsick Road. Can you spell it for me? Of course I can spell it for you. That's N U T. You know. <laughs> And uh, and we would go to uh, like Pierce's fairs, go to Arby's and steal the Arby signs, and uh, and just fuck with everybody we could. And that's like, and honestly, you know, I don't know how my, I don't remember how I was, like I remember how I was, but I, just because of that, I think at least myself became better workers as we became outspoken people, and we became, we had like, you know, instead of sitting in a car like fucking a bunch of librarians, libra not librarians, librarians, uh, we fucking, you know, we all of a sudden because of of, of Ace and Danny and Adam being so uh, out, outrageous and courageous is also then we started getting to the fun and not that we weren't before but now we had the right to do it and then now we were outspoken people all of a sudden you know now we're cutting promos on people in the middle of Walmart where the first promo I was telling the other day is like you know Mick Karch the AWA announcer was like in St. Paul he's like cut a promo and I was like oh yeah, Cole Cabana. It's a big secret of cutting promos. You just cut them on random people. Yeah, and so I, you know, I was all scared, and I see Pierce going crazy, and then all of a sudden we have all these trips, and all of a sudden we're cutting promos, and everybody, you know, some chick walks in, go, hey, we'll start with your razzmatazz, cut a promo, and you know, honestly, that's where Cole Cabana came, not Cole Cabana came from, but it's just that, fuck it, you know, the same guy walking down the street is the same guy in the fucking audience, is the same guy across the ring from me, is that I'm having a good time, and I'm, you know, and, and I can, you know, talk off, you know, I'm man, I've been dropped in my head so many times, is you know, and this is like King Promo over here. I don't, I don't cut a fucking good promo. I don't know big words. Thank you. But well, thank you. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know these big articulate words that you that you seem to come up with. King Promo. But fucking hell, you know, I'll fucking go off on somebody just because it's natural to me, and it's not, it's not the, you know, it's not the smartest thing. But you know, I call somebody a douchebag or a duty head. People laugh, and all of a sudden I can cut a good promo. Just, but I'm going off on someone just like I would anybody else, and that all kind of came from those Minnesota trips and and we did them for two three years right two three years every weekend at a point so and they just and then eventually that that stopped uh, there was like heat it was Danny. The Danny and Ace thing, I, I don't even know. Danny and Ace yeah. had a falling out with that hell. Well, I think it was Dominion mainly. They changed the name to Steel Domain Wrestling. Two minutes, two minutes left for what? For the second tape. Uh, Danny Dominion and Ed Hellier had a falling out. Quick, 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 quick. They just had a falling out about like advertising. Like there's a question like where the money was going, and uh, Danny and Ace stopped working there. But me and Cabana like would do like uh, we did like one more match, and we basically did what we want. And right. Ed Hellier's, I remember last words to me were like, "You'll never work in St. Paul again." And I was all like, "Yeah, I'll see you later." Like, we, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. But and that was the end of that. Change that tape, sucker. Uh, milkshake brings all the boys in the yard. Yeah. I f <laughs> Dude, show the, the picture of you, the training, the random. Are we filming? I don't, yeah, yeah, we're filming. Yeah. I don't know, is it your first day of training? Uh, this is me, young, young Cole Cabana, 18 years old, and I got all the chops. That was like chop class, you know, second week. I came home to a picture of that. 
because he was all proud of his yeah. battle scars. You fuck fuck fuck. Hardcore. Woo! I think the best stories, um, probably, I think a lot of the stuff we talked about might not be interesting to some people, but it could be. It is. I don't know. You know, I hope it is. I hope people are entertained, but I think the best stories to me are like how we live on, we, you know, like a completely different clock than the rest of the world. Like, I used to be, I always tell people I used to be a scientist. I was a lab tech at Underwriters Laboratory. I safety tested products for you, the public. It was the most ridiculous job ever that I wasn't supposed to have because I was supposed to have some kind of a degree, which I didn't have. I, when they asked me, I just told them I had one. <laughs> like that, you know, and like to me, like that's what the wrestling business has taught me that like yeah, because we every, got into the wrestling. everything everything is like a big work you know uh, you question everything and it's really taught me like what I can and cannot get it's almost like we're con men you know like I walked into this underwriter's laboratory like this real stuffy place you know and I got this job that I wasn't supposed to I needed a four year degree to be a lab tech and I walked in and I was just like yeah you know I'm a lab tech blah 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 and I you know like my dad's an electrician so like I bullshitted the stuff I knew and you know they gave me a job like and I never treated it as anything but second to wrestling and, and like probably for me it was like wrestling my girlfriend Nate at the time and then this job and you know like, I had to wake up at five in the morning and go to this fucking job and it was just like I hated it and we had these we had flex hours where like if you work your f full 40 hours you could split at 11 on Fridays and you're supposed to do this once a month I did it every single week you know if I had to be yeah, because you had to be that you did 10 hours a day yeah Sucked. So I like I would do, yeah, I, I would have to do like ten hours, ten hours, ten hours, ten hours, and then like Friday I would come in at six and just basically fuck off till like eleven, and then punch out, and then meet with him because it was like right down the street from his parents' house, and then we'd go to like IWA, you know, like. Mm -hmm. And to me, like what I'll always remember about wrestling and everything is about how I would sleep under my desk at work, <laughs> or about how like I would come in, like punch in, and then fucking leave, like go to go to this bagel place that like you know like you, your parents were cool to people who owned it and like just sitting there and like I mean I didn't give a damn about work and I knew how to work the people who I worked with pretty much because everybody of everybody could get worked sure everyone I've, can get worked because I've been of worked you know and it's Whoa. just like you know, I, I just think it's hilarious that I had this job that probably people would kill for. Right. You know, like, legit. Like, this real respectable job. I was a lab tech, and I wore the same work shirt every day. I would leave it at work. And, like, it was, like, the biggest blow-off thing ever. You know, I mean, I slept more than I worked there. You know, and I made real good money. Had to, it was important that you had to sleep because you had to get to sleep because we had to do road Because I had to make $30. We had to do road Yeah, like, on Saturday, when, like, if I devoted my time and my energy to this job like by now I would be making like sure. some ungodly sure. amount of money you know but it's not what I loved I hated it it was just some place I had it was just school all over well, again what, what's Tracy Smothers quote right it's I have to I have to work to, to, to support my wrestling it's habit wrestling habit you know and I'm you know I, I feel uh, real lucky that I was able to after I got fired I know shocking that I got I got laid off but let's <laughs> let's but let's, let's, day, cause you let's be honest work. dude I was asleep at my computer right. you know I mean I, I was part, I was like a, 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 a like a flamingo where I could just sleep standing up like I was at my desk and I had it like perfectly you know so like if anybody like came out here and I would just sit there like this with a pencil in my hand <laughs> and I heard somebody come in so I would just start fake writing, fake writing and I looked up and it was my section head and I looked at him and I looked down and like I saw like this big scribble line <laughs> and I'm not, not writing anything and he looks down at the paper and I looked back up at him and I went I'm fired aren't I and he was like well we need to talk and I was like awesome I was just I got like so stoked and I was like can I just grab my stuff because they were like uber corporate and they wanted like every time they would lay somebody off they would literally grab them and send them out the door and send you your things you know because they we were, they were really afraid everyone's going to like pull out a gat and like you know go nuts and he was like 
quick, go grab a box and grab all your stuff. And I didn't have a whole lot of stuff anyway. I literally just, just like grabbed all my stuff and I skipped out the door, you know? Like I was super happy and there's like the line of people like, you know, <laughs> bye. And I was like, yeah, see you later, you know? And like, and like from that point on, like I remember getting laid off and I remember not knowing what to do because it was nine in the morning and I drove to Once Upon a Bagel and I had myself some pancakes and like I drove home and I walked in the door and Ace was all like, what are you doing home? Did you get fired? You better be able to pay rent. And I was like, it's all under control, dude. Like, That's why. let's go to the gym, you know? Like, but what you did were you were fucking collecting unemployment. Yeah. And that was, to me, was the greatest thing ever. Well, to me, it was the well, greatest thing ever. Obviously, but I, you know, now he was, like, he was getting paid because you hated it so much, but you had to do it, but now you're grabbing the paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had to do it to eat. <laughs> I wasn't proud, but let's face it. Like I grew up, I grew up with my dad on unemployment. You know, I was poor my entire life. So like when it finally came time to, well, I was even lazy about it. It took me a month to file for it. Yeah. So you know, but once I finally got it, it was like I would get that check, and then it was like, let's go buck wild, and I'm gonna make a living being a pro wrestler. And yeah. if I don't make it by the time my my unemployment runs up, then I I don't know what I'll do. I'll work at Blockbuster Video, you know, something. But you know, that's I think when you like you wanted Ace. You were like, well, maybe Ace will hook me up with with a job. In Nielsen. Something. I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, but that was like last resort. Right, you know, right, I just right. remember working at Underwriters, fractured my skull, and not being at work for like a month. Yeah. You know, and like them having to pay me for that, yep. and like yeah. just working the system so much, and like using vacation days that I didn't have, and like oh, yeah. just owning that place. And it was always about just hanging out with you, and like going to shows for like 10, 30 bucks, and just all the sacrifice. And like I blew off that job. I destroyed my relationship with Nate. Like I just, you know. Like all these people around me that, like, you know, let's face it, you know, wrestling was number one. It always was and it always will be. And just, you know, like nothing else fucking mattered. And to me, like, that is the one huge bond between me and you. Yeah. You know, the same like, thing goes is I went to, to, to Western Michigan, got a degree. It was a joke, though. Like, as, you, I got a, a bachelor's in marketing degree. My mom was going, you know, you get a job, you get a job, you get a job. And me being able with a fucking degree, you know, as you saying, you know, with a, I, you know, again, I could have went out of college, so I made $50,000 right. or whatever, and I took a job as, as a as a, as a, tea, as a, a tea, a teaching assistant, and the same thing, uh, I would I would hook up so where, like, I was working at special ed, and, and I would get 8th and 9th periods, it was like I was back to school, which was kind of miserable, but I'd get, like, 8th and 9th off, and I would go sleep in the, in the gym office, and, and it's the same thing, and, and I would take sick days off, and but I, I, I let my, you know, because I wasn't a teacher, I was a teaching assistant, so I, I think I made uh, $11,000 after taxes, I made about $7,000 as a teaching, teaching in a really good a year? district. Yes. Jesus. Yes. yes. It's awful. It was horrible. It's awful. But it gave me benefits, and that was the thing. And but and then you know I had the wrestling on the side, and I was making that, and uh, and just always with the wrestling, and and, I, and but not only that is where you counting the system is I would use the colored printer, I would use the copier, I would use uh, construction paper to make gimmicks, to make anything. I remember I was, that's when I was like. Uh, well, you know, like the Macho Man CDs, where I was, I, you know, I would take their CDs and I would burn them at work, and then I would take their cover cases from music classes that they had. And this isn't me. You know, I guess it's not too proud of me, but this is the way I work, and this is the same thing where you and Joe were talking about the lucha masks. Is do anything, man. Fuck it. You know, money's money. Right. Man. And I would make copies of of the, the Macho Man CDs on the copy machine and put them in, and you know, sell them for three bucks at a show or whatever. Anyway, I would make eight by tens with the with the construction paper they had at art art class when I would take my kids to art class and, and, and then use the color copier and I would start making you know air black and white eight by tens or whatever you do to make a buck and you know and, and I had this guy and I love it and I always treat the children well and I love you know I love working with the children but it was like they knew and I knew that you know I was doing this thing to do to do wrestling. Yeah. And um and so, you know, I sometimes I guess I would slack or whatever. I would have stuff going on because, you know, we had, we had the wrestling business to fill. We had those weekends to uh, to go on, and uh, we still do. And that's what you know. But unfortunately, we're we we can make a living in wrestling now. But uh, you know, it's uh, you get those jobs, and you know, I can be a wizard in the in the marketing you know field right now, and maybe I am in, in selling gimmicks. But uh, you are. <laughs> but we're not, you know, we're not. We're, we're, we're wrestlers. Because it, it always it, it always comes down to wrestling, and that's so. In a way, like this is how I'm gonna wrap this up. This it's, it comes down to like me and his friendship, you know, where it was like I put 
everything behind wrestling, you know. But for me, it was like always wrestling, but he was always there. So it's just like he's one of the guys. There's very few, and count them on one hand, of the people in the world that I know that I could, it could be like four in the morning, it could be pouring rain outside, and I could be like in Detroit and call him in Chicago, and he'll come pick me up. You know what I'm saying? It was like because inadvertently we both put wrestling first, and in a way, it was like we were just there for each other, you know? And I think it's probably why Nate always got so pissed is because, like, I spent more time with you, you know? She probably thought we were a couple of gays. <laughs> You know, and I was always there way more for you than like, you know, I was ever there for her. And like, that's what it boils down to is just like, that's how we became friends. It's, you know, I just can't imagine, you know, like we watched Danny and Ace kind of like drift apart and I just don't ever see that happening with me and you. Like, you know. We've had bumps in the road, but it's sure. like, I think we realize that. Um, yeah. Well, we were married to each other for so yeah. long. <laughs> like literally wrestling each other so many times. And then, you know, you, you have little spats and stuff like that, but we eventually worked it all out, you know. and. and and that's why you guys see it, you see the chemistry on the and you know like why he, he's a funny guy or he he's straight edge but you know it's we fucking grew up in wrestling together and we're gonna you know keep on going to wrestling together or whatever and it's the chemistry's there and that's it's, you know the two Chicago boys it's total real life you know like this is exactly how we are in real life you know like I'm obviously a little bit more serious but I got the funny side you know and I play up the serious part he plays up the yucks and all that stuff and like fart jokes right my last fart joke did I say did I say that I heard that's, some, I think Joe that said sounds, something that sounds so demeaning <laughs> well, I'm sorry no that's that, yeah and you know if I can if, uh, if I can get by on a fart joke rock and roll right and there you go so. if he can get by on a fart joke Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Well, thanks a lot, guys, and uh, I appreciate it, and we'll have more releases coming out soon. Hey!